get started. Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday, June 8th regular meeting of the Scarborough Zoning Board of Appeals. The meeting will now come to order. This is a public proceeding and unless the board specifically votes to go into an executive session, the public has the right to hear everything that is being said and will view all of the exhibits that are being presented. Uh, please notify the chairperson, which is me, uh, if you are unable to hear or see the proceedings up here or on the TV. And the, before, and the board works from a prepared agenda and will take up tonight's items in the following order. We will have our call to order for attendance, pledge of allegiance, and roll call, and approval of the minutes from May 11th, or May 11th, excuse me. Approval of two draft written decisions heard at our, 11, our May 11th meeting, and we will have two appeals tonight, number 27 and 28. Uh, we will have zoning board comments and we will have our return. So, that being said, uh, we will have our full order for our story. Jim Siebert? Present. Peter Feinerman? Here. Rudy Heron? Here. Peter Ford? Here. Christine Snow? Here. Michelle Stevenson? Here. And Richard Sickman? Here. Excellent. Great. Um, let's stand for the applications. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, do I have approval of the minutes from the May 11th meeting? I'm, you, I'm presuming everyone has had a chance to review uh, and if anyone has any comments. Mr. Bork? No comments, so moved. So moved. Is there a second? I second. Rudy Karen seconds. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, Rudy? Aye. Mr. Browninger? Aye. Although, Mr. Chairman, for this and for the approval of draft written decisions for the next one, I was not present at the last meeting, so I uh, will excuse Great. Thank you for mentioning that. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Stone? Yes, All right. Um, it passes. The minutes are approved. Uh, next up, we have the approval of the draft for the decisions for the, for the appeals heard at the 11th of the May 11th meeting. We have appeal number 2725, the miscellaneous appeal uh, at 8 Pegas Parkway. Has everyone had a chance to review uh, the decisions? And as a general note, for board members who may not have been present at the last meeting, um, it is perfectly fine to um, abstain from approving as you did more at the meeting. But if you have had time to either rewatch the recording or go through the minutes uh, and find some back in your packets that have been provided, it is acceptable to uh, vote the affirmative for a draft written decision and the minutes. Uh, so that being said, I'll entertain a motion to approve the draft written decision for appeal number 2725. Mr. Bork? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Mr. Karen seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Karen, your vote? Aye. Mr. Brawlinger? I have reviewed it. Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Abstain. Excellent. Thank you all. And um, the draft approval passes. 27-25. Next up, we have the <coughs> approval of the draft written decision over 2026. <coughs> Has everyone had a chance to review and uh, make any comment? I'll, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve the draft written decision for 27-26. Mr. Bourne? So moved. And is there a second? I second. Mr. Karen seconds. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Karen, your vote? Aye. Mr. Frowling? Aye. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Snow? I'm staying. And I vote aye as well. Uh, I vote aye on all of those for the record. Um, the draft approval for 2726 is uh, heard and approved. Thank you. All right, first up, our first appeal tonight, appeal number 2727, miscellaneous appeal about Sprite Corporation, 395 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map, R103, Block 17. Uh, is there a representative from uh, Sprite Corporation in this application? Like, come on up, take the podium. Uh, state your name, who you're representing, and who you're with, just for the record. And uh, we'll go into the discussion where we are here. I'm Gregory Wilford. I live at 409 Black Point Road. I represent the Sprint Corporation and Black Point Resource Management that runs Scarborough Beach. Do you want me to go through? Yeah. Okay. Why don't you give us the background information of uh, uh, what the project is and what you are asking for? Then we'll go into the questions. Okay. Uh, the project is we're asking 
to use the existing lot that is a grass area with the trees in it as a parking lot, as an overflow parking lot for Stellar State Park. Uh, right now, we uh, proposed 114 spaces, but we don't necessarily want to limit it to that because that's where we want to start. At the most, we'll probably be around 200 spaces down the road because in previous years, we've had over 350 spaces with three, uh, two lots that we use. The Harmon lot held 128, and when that filled, we go into the gray lot, which held 160. Uh, I'm guessing on the years now, but four years ago. And then we also use the spread lot, just if it totally filled, so that would hold seven as of right now. Um, about four years ago, or three or four years ago, the Harmons came to me and they don't want to lease it to us anymore because they're little kids. And I supported them, I can't blame them, uh, cars going in and out, and so they stopped. So we used an entrance that used to that we used back in the 70s to the gray uh, lot and it used to go to Harmons into grays. So we used that and uh, we went back using that and the town, you know, said we changed what we were doing. So they didn't want that to occur. They let it finish out through the summer. But we were down to 160 and we were using the spread lot, which uh, 70, so it still gave us 230 spaces. Uh, so last year, uh, when we knew uh, we had pulled it um, during COVID, we were going through with the plan to be back away because of COVID. Uh, and also that under the state guidelines, all state parks had to reduce their use. So by not having the lots across the street, we didn't have to shut down any of our main lots in the park. So we were able to keep it open, but that ran out last July uh, 1st, I believe, when the state uh, canceled the uh, COVID restrictions. Um, last year, we did change our format in our parking lot, to uh, which was more vertical, where cars were uh, going uh, down the parking lot side by side like this to start doing this when uh, we cleared the uh, trees at CMP and unfortunately uh, butchered. We took the state agreed that we should take them down, so we took them down so we could clear up and make it easier to park like that. And uh, by doing that difference, it probably added 30 spots. Um, but we're still under what we were back in the 70s and 303. So the things have grown up, we just can't, can't cut everything down. So, uh, so that's where we're at. That's why we propose to come back here. Because there is a use, and it does get, and it's mostly, I compare it to Kern Park. They have an overflow. I don't know how often they use it, but um, we use it uh, basically most of the time on weekends is when we find it, unless the day's night. If it's night, you're going to be back no matter what. Uh, we do try to work with the town, especially the police department and the fire department, to make it so we can keep that street open. They allow us to uh, uh, stack cars in the morning on the uh, left side of the road on the shoulder so that the traffic goes through. I have the numerous employees are up front helping with the traffic, trying to keep it open. Uh, that's one thing we try to maintain so that we don't burden the police department. So that's what we propose. We do want to start with 114, but we, uh, the initial one was a lot more, and we do believe that with the, the growth of the town, uh, we can support 200 car parking lot East Street. Said that, a lot of people wonder is this going to impact the beach? Well, I've been there 51 years. So I've been there and I've seen it. Our dune system is the best that there is in the area. We protect the dunes. We put, uh, we have a snow fence that's up on most of the 1,600 feet of stable property. Um, we 
we do, our customers do go down onto the spray part of the beach, which is another 1,100 feet of beach and the sprays have allowed it. So that works out well. Uh, the biggest problem is the erosion on the beach. Well, that unfortunately is seawalls. Scarborough Beach State Park doesn't have seawalls. Unfortunately, Prop Smith does. And uh, so the sand gets pushed out. We have a lot of cobble. It takes a while to bring it back in the summer. But it does eventually come back. But it doesn't look like it did 50 years ago. So it is what it is. Uh, I do have a lifeguard staff of 15. So I have probably the second biggest lifeguard staff in the state. And uh, our record is phenomenal. I've been there 51 years, and no one has gone. We've had over a thousand rescues. We have rip cards all over the beach. We know it, we do it. We assist the town when they need it. So I'm just giving you an overview because these questions all come up. So I guess that's it. I appreciate that. Yep. yep. Um, This point is a lot of stuff. What is the that, please? I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, Mr. Longstaff, on this right here, uh, if there aren't any questions yeah. on here, this is a yeah, this is a miscellaneous appeal. It does not have any standards um, that go with this type of appeal. It's basically the board asking the applicant <clears throat> questions and then coming to a consensus as to whether or not they can approve parking on a lot that is not on the same lot as the activity to which the parking is useful. Great, thank you. At this point, do any members of the board have any questions for the applicant? So here we're not going to be bound by the criteria for an application, but again, addressing that there is a need and we would be approving a need. We would not be approving the number, uh, exact quantity of parking spots. We will not be dealing with anything regarding uh, the details of uh, environmental erosion or how that is treated or addressed, <coughs> or addressed in this case here that would have to that will be going to the planning board so the planning board after we approve if we do approve or disapprove uh, this application if it is approved it will go to uh, the planning board and they will handle all those details so we don't need to be bogged down thinking about quantities of spaces uh, traffic um, yeah, exactly. Things like impervious surface that could, that could take into account, but we're not going to um, worry about those items here. What we're uh, what we're approving is whether or not they would be allowed to put a parking lot here, and whether it's needed. Mr. Chair, will, will we be allowed to address what you just said? There will be a public comment in uh, just a few minutes here. Yeah. We go through our own questions here first, and then we open a public comment, and then there'll be a closed discussion with the board while we deliberate for our own decisions. I just want to be clear that I, I disagree with some of what you said, so I, so I want to be able to comment on Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that being said, any questions here? <clears throat> um, two. First off, um, just to clarify, 395 Black Point Road, the entirety of the space is owned by the Spray Corporation. They're not um, using any spaces. Um, Owned by other people or, or leased on other property owners, or yeah, that may be. Yeah, it might be best if you stay out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry. Okay. Okay. Yes, the whole lot is owned by the Sprite Corporation. They're surrounded by the sewage uh, and, and we didn't have this as part of the. I don't think we had this as part of the material. Where were the two prior lots located? Uh, they would have been. You know, I don't know the exact number, but. After the sewage treatment lot, there's Tom Connolly's house, and then next to him is the Harmons, mm -hmm. and then the Grays. Okay. So they're across diagonally from the beach. Okay, across diagonally. So this is across diagonally, but further to the north, essentially. Or, uh, or east, east, or whatever you might call it. Yes, yes. Okay. Got it. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Mr. Morgan. Yeah, I have a question regarding the, uh, uh, the contract you have with the state. Uh, you uh, obviously the state owns the beach. Yes. So if you are operating under a contract with the state, yes, we are. Right. Okay. So you, you are entitled then to represent the state in this regard. Uh, the state has no problem with us getting the lots across the street. Okay. Normally, when we do a miscellaneous appeal, it would be you know, there's common ownership of lots. But this is a much different situation 
not only that, but we're not really reviewing specific criteria where that would come up, you know, for conversation. You know, if this is really, you know, we don't have any criteria at all to review. Right. It's more based on what's common sense. Is this practical? Is this a solution in the circumstances? So I just want to make sure that the board had a clear right. understanding um, of ownership and your relationship with the state. Right. Um, back in the uh, 70s, the state leased the Harmons lot for uh, from 1976. Through 1992, they uh, leased that lot uh, from, I take it back, it would have been, they would have stopped. I know they did lease it up through the 90s, early 90s, but they stopped when uh, 92 budget cuts, that's when they decided to make discovery, which uh, is private because you have a new beach issue and the state of Maine only owned six, I mean, yeah, the state of Maine only owned 66 new beach land. So they couldn't allow the public to go on private land. And they didn't want to pay a lease anymore on, and it wasn't a big lease, on the spread land. So they decided to lease it to the spread corporation. At that point in time, I leased it for a five year period before the spread corporation Decided to sell uh, uh, 1,600 feet of beach to the state of Maine, and that was in 1980. So, um, if that answers. Thank you. Yes. And they always had them across the street. They were, and they know that we had had them, and they've been supportive of that. And if there is any way you can increase public use, they're supportive if it's in a safe area. Sure. Yes. <clears throat> I've wrestled a little bit with this because I can't quite figure out whether it's fish or fowl. I mean, we have an application in front of us <clears throat> for the use of property that's not covered by our zoning laws, our zoning ordinance. I mean, there's a recommendation that we consider this as an extension of a commercial outdoor recreation or like a commercial outdoor recreation. But in the zoning laws, the definition of a commercial outdoor or recreational facility explicitly excludes anything that's government owned, whether it's municipal or state. So if you have that explicit exclusion, it suggests that we can't consider it as a commercial facility. But there's nowhere in our zoning ordinance that we have anything that relates to beaches. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a defined use. Of course, we've been using it forever, so it exists. So we have to allow its grandfathered use. Um, but and now we've got an application to change <clears throat> its use, but we have no means of addressing it within the zoning ordinance. When I went back and I looked at the state, at state law, and it struck me that <clears throat> the governor would have the ability with a stroke of a pen to override our local ordinance for this purpose. She could simply say that this property is now exempt from state or from local zoning ordinances and it can be used as an overflow law. <clears throat> because that exists in state law, it might have been why our zoning ordinance never dealt with this issue, because there was a mechanism for dealing with it. And I'm wondering whether or not that's the appropriate way to deal with this, rather than have us try to <clears throat> jury rig a system that might be at some point subject to challenge. Because we've got a letter from one attorney <clears throat> that suggests that this is an acceptable solution to his client, but only within certain limitations. We've just heard from the applicant that those limitations aren't what they proposed. You know, we've suggested that we're not going to put limitations on it, but that's the planning board's priority. And so I'm wondering how we weave our way through this yeah. within, the, <clears throat> within what we have in front of us as both the code, you know, like our appeals process, and state law. What I would answer would be there, Mr. Silver, is that <clears throat> if we were to approve this, we would add. Um, 
uh, there's stipulations for it, notes in the motion for because this will go to play, this would go to the planning board if it is approved here tonight. And we can provide direction for the planning board to address certain issues where they have to address exact quantities of carbon of, uh, uh, parking spots in this area and they have to address uh, these more say technical issues and affecting the details of the design. We're not in a, in a position on the CBA to, to offer comments on what their design is. We're here to determine whether or not um, they would be allowed to put a parking lot there. And I guess that's where my problem lies. I mean, what standard are we making <clears throat> that determination? When I read the, the, the our miscellaneous appeals, the structure seems to be that for off-site parking, if it were to if it were to apply to this case, and I'm not sure it does, but if it were to apply to this case, <clears throat> that the planning board would have already made that determination as to how many spaces are required to meet the zoning ordinance, right? Which says you have to have parking if you're going to use your property for a particular purpose, an office space, you know. <clears throat> shopping center or whatever that would then come to us and we would grant an appeal based upon what the planning board has given us but we seem to be in in this instance and i'm wondering whether or not we have authority under our miscellaneous appeals to act without having that from the planning board because even if we try to shoehorn this under the remote parking provision that we're not doing it correctly. As the remote parking provision says, planning board brings to us the proposal, which already has all of this defined. So I have no problems with moving it forward and voting on it. I'm just, and it just strikes me that we're doing it in a way that it lends itself to challenge if anybody ever wants to challenge it. And I always hate to waste our time doing things like that. And, Brian, maybe you have an idea of how to deal with this, but any, any decision the board makes can be challenged. Well, of course it can, but some are some are more so challenging. I'm not afraid of that because it can happen. Uh, but I mean, there's one thing to challenge on <clears throat> on, a, on, a, you know, like a, on a technical issue related, but it's another thing to challenge on procedure, right? Especially when we know in advance that what we're doing doesn't apply. But the procedure. Just what was spelled out in the ordinance, it says that the board will act, but not the board. The planning board is not the recommendation of the next plan. It's happening today. So I'm not really sure I understand your confusion. Well, but you just said it. The board will act, but not before the planning board. Yeah, the planning board has that. You know, yeah. the but the planning board hasn't told us the number of spaces. That's, that's, that's where it comes back for a cycle. That's probably very in depth. <laughs> Mr. Chair, yes. May, may I interject that two years ago, some of us were on the board that approved this, uh, and it was difficult to address, uh, but in the end, we ended up approving it. Uh, and I'm not sure what the exact vote on it was, but it was you know, significantly favorable. Uh, it, this is a tough one. Uh, and, and I think uh, in the end, what we really need to look at here is What's the practical application here? We've got a parking problem at, around this beach. And um, so getting input from residents as well as police department, fire department, you know, any interested parties who have any input to us as to what's important for us to consider uh, is really uh, quite valuable in helping us move forward. And we did that two years ago. And the only reason that nothing happened was because of the pandemic and situations within the spread corporation. The other support forces make this on the back burner issue. So it's, um, you know, we just bring something back that we've already done. So I think we should really approach it the same way as we did two years ago and move forward in that direction. I'll, I'll add as well. Thank you, support. Um, the vote two years ago in 2020 was five to zero. Um, the appeal was then amended to include recommendations from the ZBA planning board that they, quote, study the effects of pedestrian traffic, local traffic, as well as visitor traffic in that area to see if any additional requirements need to be put in place from a traffic and safety standpoint point 
and to determine the appropriate number of parking spaces. And that that recommendation at the time from the zoning board was sent to the planning board. Um, again, certain things happened with the pandemic, and this was not constructed to move forward at that point. But they are back again to restart restart that process essentially. So just to add to that, the planning board never actually reviewed this two years ago for all the reasons we've stated. So right. it will eventually go through the planning board as it should if we approve. Yeah, and the planning board again, they'll they'll determine the exact footprint. You know, whether if it's whether it should be paved, whether it should be unpaved. Because um, even if you're trying to avoid impervious service by avoiding asphalt, if you have just sort of a green field parking lot, eventually that turns into a hard packed dirt impervious parking lot uh, that has its own run up issues of water and so on at that point. Um, so, but those are issues and questions that site plan review and the planning board will take care of. But again, we are here just to determine um, whether or not it, they would be allowed to move forward with putting in a parking lot, what issues and recommendations the planning board should review during their site plan review and address directly with those in that motion, like similar to what we did in 2020. <coughs> Other questions from board members? Okay. Uh, seeing none at this point, I believe um, since there aren't any criteria to go through, we will open now to the public forum. Um, so anybody who would like to speak on this particular application, see you there, sir. Um, please come on up to the podium, state your name, who you are representing, why you're here, and um, I would only ask that since there are a great number of us here, depending on which application you are here for this evening, please try to keep your comments directly pertaining to the application itself and try not to stray. Thank you. Good evening, I'm just chairing members of the board. Uh, my name is Matt Manahan. Uh, I represent the Proxnet Improvement Association. And you should have before you a copy of the letter that I sent to you uh, last Friday. I apologize for the late letter, but um, I'm here to discuss that letter. Um, and uh, I just want to preface this by saying that we support the uh, Sprague Corporation's request uh, in general, we think that parking spaces are important for Scarborough Beach State Park, um, and we think that uh, there is obviously a parking issue there. However, it's very important in our view that the number of spaces should be limited to what was requested in 2020, which is 114 spaces. Now, interestingly, I think I counted on the current uh, proposal, it looks like 84 spaces, but we heard um, the applicant's representative tonight mentioned 114 spaces, which is the same as 2020, and, and that's what we believe is appropriate. Um, if, if the, and, and as has been discussed, there really is not uh, very clear standards in your ordinance for this, um, and that's a problem. But with respect to what Mr. Silton was saying, I, I do think it's very important to recognize that the, the standard that does apply um, at least on its face, uh, which is your miscellaneous appeal provision uh, 5B4C. It, it at least says what you can do. And if you break it down, it's got essentially three criteria. Um, it says that to approve an application for off-site, off-street parking, um, to permit the location of the prior off-street parking on lots other than lot containing the principal building use, uh, where it cannot reasonably be provided on the same lot, subject to the conditions of Section 11. So the first part is it has to be required off-street parking. And to know if it's required off-street parking, you have to look at Section 11 of the ordinance. And if you look at Section 11 of the ordinance, it lists as a table and it says for various uses, you know, depending on the square feet, if it's a shopping center, you know, per square feet or something. And so that's based on the ordinance. And then there's a provision right before the table. And what it says is that if the use isn't listed here, the planning board has to figure it out, has to issue a determination, that's what it is, and they have to consider various factors, not many factors, it's pretty subjective as well. But, so the only way for you to know whether you can approve option parking is to know whether option parking is required. Now, we all kind of recognize that it should be required here. We think it's 114 spaces. But you can't know that because what if the planning board came back and looked at this and they decided that all that would be required for this use, Scarborough Beach State Park, is 200 spaces. That's what they think is required. If that were the case, there would be no 
off street parking that is, and this is the second part, that cannot reasonably be provided on the lot containing the principal use. So this, the, the criteria that you have to look at, you have to decide what's required and whether the required spaces can be provided by the principal lot that is containing the use. So if they say 200 spaces is required, then there will be none that can't be provided on this lot. If they say 220 spaces is required, then you can say, okay, well, you have to provide 20 spaces off-site. But the point, our point is, you can't do that. And that's why we asked the planning board on Monday night, can you please make the determination how many spaces is required? Because without that, the Zoning Board of Appeals can't actually act pursuant to the order. They have no authority. You have no authority to act. So that's the first problem. Um, the second problem is, frankly, the vague standards. Um, it's, the Main Supreme Court has been very clear that, particularly under zoning ordinances, the board has to have clear standards. Otherwise, it's what's called a unreasonably vague delegation of legislative authority, which is void for vagueness. We obviously don't want to go there. We think that you should restrict it to 114 spaces, which is what we asked the planning board to, to conclude. The, the third big problem here is that, as I think Mr. Sutton alluded to, is that this is an existing use, so it's non-conforming. It, it existed before the ordinance. But this is an expansion of a use from what existed prior to the adoption of the ordinance. You can't expand a non-conforming use unless you meet the requirements of the non-conforming use sections of your zoning ordinance. And in this case, the applicant hasn't even requested that. Um, even if he could request, even if the applicant could request it, uh, he hasn't. And so, but but let's say he did. You'd have to come in and review those standards, decide that it can be expanded under the zoning ordinance. But then secondarily, because the use is the state park in the resource protection district, you also have to look at what the non-conforming use expansion requirements are in the shoreland zone under your shoreland zoning ordinance. To do that, it's even more restrictive. You can't expand the use in, in the shoreland zone, particularly the resource protection zone, which is the most highly protected. You can't expand the use off-site unless you meet very stringent requirements, which are not met. So our basic point is, we don't want to get into that. We prefer to avoid it. We think the planning board should have recommended 114 spaces. We would support, our, our suggestion to you tonight is that you do approve this. But, you, but to, to satisfy us, to satisfy the applicant, at least with respect to where they want to go for now, approve it with 114 spaces. Limit the grass so it's natural, no artificial lighting. And then the applicant could come back to you in the future, do it right, and ask for more than 114 spaces. But that at least would avoid the issue where we're fighting about this, and we have to go to the planning board later this month through the site plan and fight about it there. Frankly, we think it makes the most sense to do 114 spaces. Um, and frankly, extremely sympathetic to what Mr. Silken said, in, which is, you know, is that really the right thing to do here? But really, the, the process here is not clearly provided, it's really not provided more than the ordinance that just articulated. But to solve that problem, we would propose sort of this sensible solution. We think it makes sense. And so that's what we would ask you to do. 114 spaces, grass with no artificial light. All right. and, and just and just one final point, Mr. Chair, um, which is that the if, if you don't limit it in that fashion, the applicant could could, wouldn't have to come back here at all in the future. If, if the applicant gets approval for 114 spaces from the planning board during site plan review, then they want to do more spaces. You heard the, the applicant say that we might like to do 200 spaces. The applicant would not need to come back to you at that point because you've approved an unlimited number. Um, so the applicant would just have to go back to revise the site plan approval. We think, again, that's a broken process. That's not, that's not how the process should work. So thank you. And, have to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, well, Mr. All right, so what you're saying is that we should, even though the planning board's responsibility to do this, we should limit it to 114. That's not within our purview. Is that correct? I believe it is within your purview because. Why? Can you explain? Well, here, here's my explanation. We would have supported, we believe the planning board should have limited it to 114 spaces. They, haven't even heard this yet. they did here on Monday, they refused to limit it. 
but our view is that based on the number of users and the experience of, of the members of our association and the neighbors that 114 is the reasonable carrying additional spaces is the reasonable carrying capacity of the resource of the street and we think that that would have been the right decision for the planning board to make and so and there was no one there on monday night that took the contrary position so so our view is that the planning board could have and should have recommended or limited it to 114 spaces and therefore because there was no one who took a different position it would be appropriate for you to do so tonight now i, I totally get that they didn't do that on monday night i understand your reservation but that's but i'm trying to come up with it i'm trying to make a um a, a suggestion that will work without having to fight like this so what, what troubles me about what you just said is why do you think we're more qualified than the planning board to do that job that's their job not ours I, I, I hear you. Um, only to settle a dispute. That's, that's, that's the planning board show. Um, they didn't do it on Monday. So. They can do it in the future after we, if we approve. See, that's the problem. They, they, they can't. Our, my position is, and, and, and this is what it says, is you can only approve it if you find that there's what the required number is and that it's necessary to have those off site. That's what the ordinance says. You can't approve it without that being done first. If they do it afterwards, it doesn't help. But we are not, so uh, Mr. Manning, we are not designers here on this on this board. We are we are architects, engineers, real estate brokers. There are you know we're volunteers in the community. Our purview here is to go into that deep technical analysis on it because that's not. Well, we're not asking you, Mr. Chairman, to design. We're not asking you to do anything. No, I, I, just, I understand, but you know, coming up with an arbitrary number like 114 spaces, granted that is the number that was in the application. Exactly. It's not arbitrary because the absent proposal. Let, let me finish, please. Um, we're not designers. We're, there are the 114 spaces originally proposed to us. They could get, use that number if they wish to. But really, in the site plan review, that's where that's where you should be making this case, and really not here. And I agree with you. The ordinance is very vague when it comes to um, this particular scenario. A lot of that's why a lot of the folks come to the zoning board because there really is a lot of ambiguity in this, in the zoning ordinance. Otherwise, no one would be here. Um, however, your argument for this, I believe, is better suited for the site plan review, where the town engineer is involved and the town planner is involved. Um, not here where we're deciding whether or not uh, a parking lot is needed there. Uh, Mr. Frothinger, do you have a question? I have a couple of clarifying questions, actually. Go for it. That's okay. Um, first off, maybe Brian, um, the property at uh, 395, I think, um, Blackwood Road, is that the, the um, yeah, 395 Blackwood Road, is that in um, uh, the Sherland or in the um, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the back end, it's, it's rural stuff. farm. It's that was, that's what I kind of looked at when I saw the, that. That's not right. The, the, the back half mm -hmm. of, of the subject property, so it's 60 acres. The 30 acre, the back 30 acres is within the resource protection. Yeah, going in the opposite direction, yeah. away from where they want to park. Correct. So don't, don't muddle it up. It's, it's, we're, we're talking about the city. They're not going to park in the yard. And then it, the, the properties before, I think the, the, they were the, the Harmon properties and the Gray properties. How many, um, uh, park, how many parking spaces did those support? Uh, and maybe that's a question for. That's a question for the applicant. Yeah. Can I answer it from there? Certainly. 128 at Harmon's and 160 at Gray's. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Again, you can clarify questions if you want to make sure that we've got the, 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 those facts out there. I guess at this point, Ms. Ming, is there anything further you'd like to enter into public comment? No, not unless the board has more questions for me. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the public? Sir, please. Okay, please state your name and your address. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marvin Gates. Uh, I live at 423 Blackmont Road. When this appeal appeared for the first time back in February of 2020, I was here and spoke in front of you and uh, greatly appreciate your work. Uh, parenthetically, I'm a member of the Zone Board of Appeals. I understand what goes with you, what you're doing. Thank you for it. I'm, uh, I'm a neighbor and uh, my 
concerned about the 395 Black Point Road property has to do with its 60 acres and the use that this will establish for those 60 acres. And uh, the real question I have is, is the use that you're contemplating an uh, accessory use for the property? Or is it a principal use? Does the ZBA have an understanding of which it is? Is it a principal use that's being established here or an accessory use? If it's an accessory use, I take it that the principal use is agriculture. The section 5 e 4 provision contemplates that your board may allow the off-site parking use as a second principal use of the off-site lot, but it's not clear. For the zoning board of appeals to allow off-site parking, the lot proposed for that off-site parking can't be used for any other purpose. In which case, I suppose, the agricultural use of that lot would have to cease. I'm asking you really what your understanding is about that. Is this that you're contemplating this parking lot? Is it going to be principal use? Of 395 Black Point Road, or is it going to be an accessory use? And do you know? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it. On this one right here, with regard to this question, we're, we're just addressing whether or not they would be allowed to put a parking lot in this space, whether that um, the zoning or um, existing use for that space would change in the future. That would be, again, from the planning board's purview to see how that would potentially change, but not from our perspective here. Are there any further public comments? Yes. Hello, my name is Tom Conley. I'm the neighbor here. And I um, appreciate your time. Uh, I'm, I'm, Against the project. Tom, can you just look at the needle there? Sorry. If, if you look at the map, I'm right across from the beach. I'm in the pincer movement between the beach and this new project. Gotcha. And so, you can wake up the address, 417 Blackburn Road. Gotcha. And when you put this in, you can wake up in the morning with, uh, what do you say, 114 cars in now. We're right now with three. Maybe three in there sometimes. Though. So, this is what you're going to be. Each one of you should imagine yourselves. This is what it has the impact. So we you know, suddenly put a parking lot about that size right next to my house. Okay? Now, that does impact the value of my land, the health of my children, and the pond. You don't mention the pond at all. Okay? The pond is less than 600 feet from the edge of that, not off. You say you have no standards that you have to apply here. You should know that Hill versus the Town of Wells spells them out and miss all in this appeal of zoning board of appeal. You have to take into account a lot of things. You can't just say, well, we're just here to prove it. You can't just have findings not based on fact. Okay. You say, well, there's an obvious parking problem down there. There's not. There's a problem of profit, not having enough profit. Not having this parking lot there makes no difference. Can the people have access to it as they have access to it? They want to expand it because it's a for-profit enterprise. But whoa, no, it's the state of Maine. And Mr. I'm sorry, you're tired of it, Mr. Silver. It's, it, it's a state agency. No. 
it's a corporation leased the property and then released the property. But that's what we have. The original deed on the place that says it must remain a state agency. It's right in the deed. Now, it's incumbent upon this board to make a determination whether there's an impact. And without a determination, without criteria, the gentleman from the Cross Neck Association was 100% right. Well, the law has got a fourth view of men. It's absolutely going to happen. And so it has to be dealt with. You can't just say, we're only here to say, approve it, and then later on, leave it to, to the planning board to decide what are the details. No, you have to decide not to approve it. And the reason you have to decide not to approve it is because, first and foremost, the Town of Wells, Hill versus Town of Wells, says it is the affirmative obligation of the petitioner, them, for an exception to establish by a preponderance of evidence that it will not cause impact to the community. Affirmative. It's not, it's not that you have to assume there's a problem that they, and that they have a problem. You have to, they have to affirmatively prove that they have a problem. And they have to affirmatively prove that it will not violate traditional use. They have to affirmatively prove that it will not cause a environmental impact. It's affirmative. You can't just say it's not an issue. It is an issue. Now, for the state project, they have the DEP particularly requires. There's a lot of regulations on that. And, and it's addressed <coughs> clearly in the Prop Neck Association what the rubric there is. And that's years of litigation. We have here an allegation that there's historic use. There's not historic use of parking in that spot. The gentleman, I'm sorry, sir, I don't know you didn't approach me. He's going to write the site. This is Mr. Bork. Sorry, sir. Thank you. Mr. Bork. You referred back what the difference was between now and then back in 2021. First, I didn't even notice. Secondly, I wasn't here. This, this one gentleman was. Thank you for coming. I see you're out of There's a difference. The second difference, and profoundly legally, is called latches. Latches mean they had the right to do it, and they didn't, and they lost the right to do it. So they don't get a pro forma gimme. It's not a mulligan. They have to start from scratch. They have to prove the case. They have it. The lawyer's called the 12B6 motion to dismiss to be granted because they haven't met the criteria to show that it doesn't impact the community. They say it doesn't. And you cannot take it in priority. They say it must be true. The same with the environmental impact. You cannot take it in priority, especially when the number is variable, whether it's going to be asphalt that is variable. Whether Massacre Pond is going to become Clark's Pond is no concern of you. You're not even going to think about it. It's not our problem. We'll, we'll kick it out of the planning board. No. The law court's clear in, in Hill versus Wells. It's your responsibility in this lady's appeal and assume you do. So I'm saying it shouldn't be allowed. It is true that heretofore there had been parking in the two adjacent lots. First, they were off street and in the sand pit. Secondly, it was long standing, more than 25 or 30 years. Thirdly, they stopped it because it was a danger to the children. That's why they stopped it. And so now, you, you gotta move it on to the street. And the number of cars, 114, you multiply that out, there is no sidewalk. The crosswalk is on my property which is what, 114 cars, not four people, maybe kids, right on my lawn all the time, across, 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 with the noise, the smell, the trash, the dog poop. They have to, you have to take that into account at some point. Who's, who's not gonna? But who's gonna cry for Master Pond? Master Pond is a gem. It's a gem. And it's close. It's so close to this that each car that's going to be there has an average of a half a tank. There's going to be hundreds of thousands of gallons of gas, oil, tires that are within a stone's throw of that pond. And, and if you don't take care of it, and your criteria here 
Who's going to take care of it? The plan won't work because they already said it. It's been approved. And then you do this double shuffle that I just heard about. It's there in the tile system. But then they get 114. And he didn't say it was 114. He said it will take as many as we can get. It's not the way I heard it. If it goes from 114 to 126, because we can stack it like cordwood, or like Japanese uh, condos, fine. It's not your problem, huh? It's my problem. We already cut it. But back to your question about what happened before, and they did, we, we voted for it before, so it's fine now. They told you that since then they've been using it. Knowing that it's non conforming, it says right in their petition. It says right in their petition. And they used it. That's called, under the law, equitable estoppel. You can't say it's fair to give us this. When they knew they weren't allowed to do it, they continued to do it. And they've been doing it. And they cut the trees in anticipation of doing it. And they cut the other trees on the other side in anticipation of doing it. And why? Because they're a corporation. And they want to make profit on it. The state of Maine didn't do it. They went, the state of Maine said they, well, they can do anything they want. That's what he said. Talk to DEP. You kidding me? Some of you contractors, I know. <laughs> you think DEP just says whatever you want? Fine with us. Put the porta bodies within 15 feet, 20 feet of the pond. Okay, how many people are going to come floating in there? Okay, if we have 114, 200, 300 new cars in there, how many people are going to need new toilet facilities? How many? Or where's it going to go? Or are they just going to use my backyard like they do now? Fair, fair enough. Of course, it doesn't worry. But you're suddenly adding more and more all the time. And there's no need for it. Why? Why do they need those spaces? Because we need more beach. We obviously have a parking problem. Why? Because you need more beach. You need more access. Why? It's been operating on a pretty stable system for I've been there 32 years. And that ancillary parking lot had been cut only like 40 years ago. My daughter says the butterflies are gone. And she says there's three species of milkweed there. And she says that there's two kinds of moles that aren't there anymore because they cut it. And then, are they going to pave it? What about drainage? Where's the study telling you that it's not going to pollute the pond? Prove me wrong. I'd be happy to hear that. You notice the picture doesn't show the pond. What is that? You need more cars, cars, cars. You, need, you just have to have them come down there. Why? Why? And does that change the environment? Does that change the neighborhood? That's their burden to prove it doesn't. You failure to do that, and I'm done. I see your head. I see something. That's all. But I'm, I'm okay. This is, this is not right. This is not right. And I want some questions all day. Please. No? Thank you, Mr. Conway. Any other members of the public would like to speak? Okay, seeing that up. Mrs. Warren. One moment. Uh, I, I would just uh, like to ask whether the representative who's great would like to review any of the comments that were made. To comment on what was said. Would, would you care to refute any of the comments that were just made? Yeah. Um, one to the state. Uh, to to the whole public. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> one, we have no plans ever to tar it. There were no trees that were taken down in that lot. Or this. That lot was cleaned up because of the invasive species that were in there, and then it was a field, and that's what it will continue to be. The big trees that are in that lot, our plans are even if we made it the 114 spaces, none of the big trees are going to be taken down. The only thing that will be taken down are the invasive bamboo and the invasive bittersweet and any scrub trees. Um, Porta potties, 
public doesn't use them this time of year. We have all toilets at the other end. There is no reason why anyone would go in the back of Mr. Conley's yard now, maybe when we had the Harmon slot, that could occur. But uh, most likely that would have been on sewage treatment land or uh, the rest of the Harmon's land. But uh, there's no reason for anyone right now. Secondly, in between Mr. Conley and this lot is the town's property. That is the sewage treatment plant road that goes all the way down. And it's probably a good 150 feet across before it gets to Mr. Conley's land. So he doesn't abut this property at all. The second thing is the farm field that's in back, nothing would ever change with that. Uh, it's a runoff. I hate to disagree with them, but since we use this on weekends primarily, you're talking July and August to later then is when this lot will be used. And it's used very rarely during the week unless I say you have 90, but let's go back and look at the history in 93 days. We don't have many. So I won't skew that. And on the trees that were on the road. If the power lines weren't there, those trees would still be there. When the power lines were low, and those trees became a danger because of the way they cut the tops off and they split up. So you got to have safety first, which is what we're about to do. So that's all I'll spew there. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, the close of the public public forum. We're going to deliberate now internally as a board. Uh, so, questions, comments, discussions? Sure. Yes, Mr. Silver. So. I mean, uh, this may not be a fair question because I don't think any of us were at the planning board meeting. But do you know, or Brian, do you know why the planning board didn't follow their procedure correctly and determine how many spaces were required to support the beach? on an off-site basis as the zoning requirement specifies? Yeah, I mean, that's not, it's not our purpose to determine whether the whole planning board acted appropriately or not appropriately. That's not, not well, <clears throat> my only thinking here is that <clears throat> we're getting this as a blank slate. This man has said, <clears throat> about what we're approving isn't completely clear to me. I mean, we aren't approving a number that was provided to us by the planning board. I think all of us would probably feel comfortable with 114 spaces. But if the planning board were to come back and say, based on their evaluation, <clears throat> the beach is considerably more crowded than it's ever been in the past, for whatever reason, and we think 400 spaces are required in order to support that use as a beach. I think we all have a little bit of problems with that, but we would have granted them the authority to do that without ever having to come back to us. And it strikes me that one option that we might have, and I'm not going to suggest this because it will set up con stop conversation, but one option that we might have is to consider tabling this sending it back to the planning board with the direction to ask them to do their job politely, of course. Give us the recommendations on the number of spaces that we should be considering and for us to consider at that point. And I, I, we can do that through this vehicle that we're doing right now, Mr. Silpin, and in that historically, we know that it's un it is unsafe during peak summer months there for parking and people walking on the roads that are on the sidewalks there. The roads are tight, the roads are very narrow, we've all been there. Um, the current parking lot is at capacity during the summer months. It is unsafe and it is preferable. I mean, for- <coughs> But we're not you said earlier, we're not engineers. We've never found that. Correct. So you're, you're, right. I mean, there's nothing in our documents that says the existing operation of the beach is unsafe. Now, we may think it is because we use it occasionally, we go there, but there's nothing in the record that says it is. That's what the planning board has to find. That in order to use the beach for that purpose, 
it has to have more parking places than is available on that site. And they have not found that. Correct. And in that, I agree with you in that we are all residents of this town. We take our, in our personal knowledge, why we are here on this board to help inform our decisions on this. And as part of this motion, we can amend the motion to include that the planning board studies the effects of pedestrian traffic, studies the effect of uh, uh, incoming traffic based on the increased development at other portions of the town where the town population is increasing for more people are moving in, more people are coming to our beaches from away and from here as well. We can instruct the, uh, instruct the planning board as part of our motion on this appeal to review this from a traffic and safety and environmental impact standpoint. And that would be their that would be their, their purview under their site plan would be where they do go into the technical details such as <clears throat> we have the opportunity I don't need to hold no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see if there's anybody has questions on the side. It's okay, <clears throat> would we have the opportunity to uh, approve this for a limited time period? Would we have the opportunity, for example, to say that we accept the 115, 114 parking places for this coming beach season, but that that's the extent of our approval. And at that point in time, we would expect to hear back from the planning board with respect to what they must find in order for us to make a determination. And there is an expediency to this problem, right? And we have the summer coming up, and we're going to have a hot day, and we don't want to have cars on the side of the road. Right. Um, but I don't think that we should be in a position of granting something that will be forever without any kind of a record in front of us in terms of what it is we're approving. And, but we would never do this for a, a house that wanted to assign there and say, you know, you really can't build that house there, but we're going to give you the approval to do it, and then the planning board will tell you how to do it. I mean, we, we couldn't do that. And, but yeah, that's what we're asked. That's what we're being asked to do: is give them approval to do something that we don't know what it is they're going to be doing. So, one one thought that I had was maybe to offer this, since we're winging this anyway, and this is on the fly. What we might want to suggest doing is giving them the approval to do this for one year, having the planning board follow through with your recommendations, Mr. Chair, in terms of the studies. And then once they've made that determination to come back, have the applicant come back to us with those findings, and then we could at that point approve an off-site use for parking based upon that recommendation, if we, if we thought it was appropriate. Mr. Chair, anything on that? First. Go ahead, Mr. Bolton. Go ahead. Just, this is a two-step process. We're step one. Okay. All we uh, decided here is whether or not that lot can be used as a parking lot. That's it. Okay. Then the second step is planning board gets it. They can't do anything until we decide one way or the other. That could be a reason why they didn't do anything at this past meeting. Because it, it wasn't time yet. We hadn't approved it yet. So if we, we either approve it or disprove it, it can't be limited. But that's, but that's not the way the recommendations that we made to the planning board just as we did two years ago, mm -hmm. and we can add to that certainly. But it is we really have to follow the process here. We can't step out of our path, you know, out of our box of the way we should do this procedurally. And Mr. And Burke, we, we are because the, the, we don't have the authority to approve a use as a parking lot unless we make the finding that that use is necessary to allow the beach to be used in its current, for its current purposes. But in order to make that finding that it's necessary, the planning board has to tell us how many spaces are required. That's what the, that's the process. I, I just agree with that completely. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. I I and and, and with, with respect to, to, to your issue, I see where you're coming from. I, I agree with Mr. Bork. I think we are here to understand does the state park 
require the use of an overflow parking lot. And we'll just say an overflow parking lot without saying this one or anything like that. And I think the applicant or the, 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 the applicant has shown that to date they've needed to use on days where it exceeds 90 degrees and on the weekends up to, it sounds like about 300 spots um, between the Harmon and the Gray Lots, which are no longer available. And therefore you have a deficit of approximately 300, um, not the Caribbean on, on the exact. And it's attempting to be refilled by a proposal of up to 114, but that will be subject to planning, um, planning committee um, review. Um, I, I think as members of the town, as hearing the evidence presented of what's gone away versus what has been used in the past, we've got a case which describes the need for overflow parking for the state park on a number of days during the season, weekends and 90 plus um, a degree days. Um, this is a potential use for a lot owned by the applicant, not leased or anything like that, but owned by the applicant. Um, with a potential read under the RF zoning code to allow for its use to support a related property. So I think we've got enough facts on that. Now, do we have enough to approve 114 spaces or 84 or 172? No, but that's the planning process. The planning process approved. Um, have they met the binary condition of do we have evidence that suggests that an overflow lot is required for the efficient operation of Scarborough Beach State Park? Yeah, I think they have. Um, and the, the, the details of that lot now go to the other parts of the town planning and code process that, that own those things that we own. So that's kind of how I work on for environmental impact sake that while I wouldn't want to see it paved with traditional pavement like parking lot or here, there are other environmental um, there are stone there are pavers that can be put down that support saw and grass. So it looks like a field, but they can collect so it won't rain I would like to add that to them. There are environmentally sound ways to have it look like a field but be protecting the environment at the same time. What I'm doing is making some notes uh, for a motion to discuss. Any other comments from the board here? Well, my, well, my thoughts on this, again, it's been pointed out, it's very vague and, and 
and sort of ambiguous uh, section of the org, which is why the folks are here discussing this here tonight. Um, the, the, the information provided in the application shows me that there is a Probably can point out there is a deficit in parking spots that's going to be uh, happening very shortly for all um, The population in the town of Scarborough is only growing. There are only more people coming in here each year. And the fact that there is a, um, it is, for me, it is a positive thing to see that a, a, a owner of their own property willing to develop their own property for this, to provide the parking spaces for this. Uh, lack of parking that's in that space. Nobody wants to see cars parked on the side of the road where it's explicitly shown. Nobody wants to have a car turn around in their driveway. Nobody wants to have a car parked right in front of their house with their tires on the front lawn. Um, it's not a perfect scenario, but we have to live within the boundaries of this town that's growing ever so rapidly and try to make amends that to sort of satisfy everybody here. What we can't do is design and put restriction on this when this hasn't been studied yet by a traffic study, by uh, sedimentation or environmental consideration, um, a traffic flow study, an analysis of pedestrian traffic in that area to see where should sidewalks be. Should sidewalks be on certain parts of the road or not? Uh, should traffic signals be there or not? Because of all the people that are out there, it's much safer from um, the traffic circulation flow standpoint for uh, an organized parking uh, layout to be in place rather than just putting a bunch of cars on someone's back lot behind their house on the grass. It's much safer to actually have something that's clearly labeled for cars and people to go with their family and their kids. Um, should, should we uh, vote to allow uh, the parking lot to go here or not, that is up for the board to decide. Um, I, will, I will make a motion, I will entertain a motion that will move on, we will go into a discussion phase and the details of what that motion would be, and then we will vote up and down whether or not the motion will pass and go to the planning board, or the motion will fail. So moved. I haven't made my motion yet. <laughs> for your uh, so enthusiasm. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I will I will enter I will now entertain a motion to approve appeal number twenty seven twenty seven with the following conditions: um, one, the planning board has to study the effect of pedestrian pedestrian local, uh, pedestrian traffic, local vehicular traffic, as well as visitor vehicular traffic in that area to see what the exact requirements will need to be put in place from a traffic and safety point of view. Uh, second, the planning board is to include an environmental study of sedimentation and erosion in that space to confirm that any, any parking lot put into the space won't affect the local environment in a negative way. Can we include that it should not be to a uh, A little too detailed, but That would be too detailed, I won't conclude. But let me finish with this first, and we can, if you want to add that in, we can discuss that. Um, Mr. Chair? Uh, wait, no, I'm still in the <laughs> yeah. um, Lastly, the, the, town, the planning board will provide a maximum number of parking spots that will be allowed on this block. Rather, the planning board will have, will rec we recommend that the planning board provide a maximum number of parking spots in the space, just so that we don't see that over-expansion, over-growth uh, in, in initial, um, those, those initial moments where everything starts to sort of spread out and control the That is my motion. So moved. Is moved by Mr. Ford. Mr. Sullivan seconds. Second. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan seconds it. Um, so now we're in the discussion. So those are our uh, condition, current conditions that we have on there. Pedestrian traffic, local traffic, visitor traffic, um, maximum number of parking spots in terms of the planning board, and sedimentation and erosion environmental considerations of the design and the board and the necessary route for neighbors in that space. Are there any questions? Yes. <clears throat> is it our expectation that the planning board is going to conduct all of these studies prior to allowing 
the use of the land as a parking because it's not highly unlikely that you want to get up in this summer or is are they going to do it over the next five years? Um, the time frame on that is not up to our determination. I mean, I, from a construction standpoint, I think it's very challenging to try to do all of that this year. I'm really a project on this scale, by uh, magnitude construction, would more likely be something that would be over the next year or so. For as far as coming up with a design, uh, submitting it to the uh, site planning board for their review, um, hiring contractors to perform these soil tests, geotech survey, um, any kind of environmental erosion studies, a traffic study in that space. Um, this most likely will be a traffic study where they, you know, they lay a cable across the road and they measure the number of cars coming out of that space over a period of time. Um, I don't think, I personally don't believe that this would be something that would be acted upon immediately, but. If so, these would be the things that the planning board would need to address before they would make a decision on them. So, so our approval isn't conditioned on them doing those studies. It's our approval is a blanket approval, and then if they do those studies, that's good. We recommend that they do them and determine a, a maximum number. But the ability to use this lot for parking purposes once we vote is unconditioned. Correct. I just want to make that clear. And that actually helps for me to actually, um, uh, the, um, I worry that if we were to bind the planning board that we might be stepping outside of our, of our uh, uh, swim for what we do as a ZBA. Um, and uh, and, and I, I'd, I'd rather keep just to the, to the approval of Ford and uh, the, the approval of, of this with the recommendation that the planning board undertake the study that you described, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, and with the recommendation they set a limit on the absolute number of, 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 of spaces. Additional background on that well, um, as well for free Richard, um, the planning board will submit, they will have reviews on applications that they submitted to us, and they will have recommendations for us to consider. They don't typically ever give us anything by that we have to do. The planning board doesn't tell us that we have to approve it. They don't tell us we have to disapprove it. The planning board will say, um, we have reviewed this favorably under these following conditions. We could not approve it. We could disapprove it, or we could approve it. So we're, we're, we don't hold the planning board to um, any, any contractual standards. Mr. Chair, can I add to that? Uh, there are situations where the planning board uh, does have the authority to tell us that we must approve unless we can find <coughs> evidence uh, and show a cause why we shouldn't approve. Yes, there are instances there are like that. There are a few, few instances that we don't typically see, but yes, right. you are correct. But in this situation, if that doesn't apply, we can basically we're going to say yes or no, it can be a parking lot, and then the planning board decides. All the parameters of everything. Correct. And with our recommendation, we want to consider, but they're going to go much deeper than what we say. Correct. I mean, that's why they have the town engineer as part of their staff permanently on the planning board, as well as uh, the town planner. Any other comments? Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion, I'll start with you, Mr. Carey. Aye. Uh, Mr. Frelinger? Aye. Mr. Sultan? Aye. Uh, Mr. Bork? Yes. Uh, Ms. Stevenson? I would like to abstain. Uh, I can't abstain on this. Oh, okay. Has to be I'm a yes nay. or no. Nay. That is a no. And Ms. Snow? Aye. And I will vote aye as well. Uh, you two will pass for now. I'm to the site planning for the review. Thank you. Next up, we have appeal number 2728. A limited reduction of yard size variance to propose a minute to set up.
Okay. I did, I did. All right, so we are now uh, on to our next appeal, 2728. This is a limited reduction of yard size variance at 7 Cliff Street. Is there someone here representing the applicant? Mr. Walt, I see you there. Why don't you tell us who you are, uh, where you're from, and why we are here? I'm David Walter Wilson from the design company out of South Lane. And I'm here to represent the watchers on this application. Okay. Sorry, generally describe a project and why a limited reduction of yard size is needed. While we pull up, we can uh, pull up the PBS on that one. Those ladies here. The beer wouldn't be a little bit of both my glasses, and I'm using a 15 year old. <laughs> no! Uh, the property is improved the resident that was built in 1908. The original cottage was approximately 20 by 28 feet, with a front porch 6 foot by 28 foot. Over the years, dormers were added to the, on the front and rear roof of the structure. A potting shed was also constructed in the rear yard. We can review that on the site plans that I supply. The front of the building is located 4.2 inches from the property line. And the right side of the main building is located 5.6 inches from the right property line. And a small addition on this side extends to the property. The proposal before you is to reframe the building by adding a second floor. I can explain that later. And a front facing gable with roof dormers, a finished third floor attic, and a 12 foot by 28 foot rear addition of the building. The existing foundation is to be utilized, improved, and added to in order to perform the required improvements. The existing rear yard potting shed is to be removed. The existing driveway is to be modified for access to the proposed carriage house located in the rear of the property. And that's about the extent in general of what we want to do. Okay. We'll go into our criteria. We have five criteria here. You can read your answer right into the record. Number one. Existing buildings or structures on the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is requested were erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, or the lot is a vacant non conforming lot record. The existing building was built in 1903 for the town established tax records. Number two, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. Uh, proposed reconstruction of the existing building, in addition to the second floor, and the design changes for the third floor attic roof dormers meet the requirements of the Higgins Beach Carrot Base CDCR zoning district. The proposal has received design approval. Project. I attached the letter of that. The proposed carriage house was also reviewed, as well as the proposed site plan changes, conformity with design, lot coverage, and placement. The proposed improvements of the existing cottage meet the CDCR1 zoning district requirements for height, shape, size, height, and shape. Most existing buildings at Hidden Beach need ZBA action in order to proceed with renovations and additions. The requested reductions for front and right side yard setbacks are reasonably necessary to permit the owner to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zone district. Number three. Due to the physical features and of the lot and or the location of existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size requirements. The location of the existing cottage was established in 1903 between before zoning requirements were enacted. The placement now requires the relief requested in order to approve that building. 
if the building was reloaded, relocated on the property to meet the required setbacks, it would have to be, of course, taken down and uh, located eight feet from the easterly sideline and set back a minimum of 18 feet from the front property line. The left side, the west side of the building, would be approximately six feet from the property line. This would not allow for a driveway. Uh, we need a variance for a setback on the west side line. Parish house would count these. It would not be practical to relocate the building to conform with currently applicable guide sizes. Right. Number four, if the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion or new building or structure on existing uses in the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of the building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. <laughs> The existing use of the property is residential and after the proposed improvements are made it will remain residential. The neighborhood is primarily residential. <clears throat> the proposed building design conforms to the CDCR when its own requirements and is within the size and height limits specified by the district. The impacts and effects of the proposed structure <clears throat> improvements will not be such substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effect of the building which conforms to the yard sizes. This question is sometimes not a problem because it starts out with the use of the, of the building. We do not talk about the building structure. It talks about the use of the property. That's why I started my answer. Uh, it's residential use. The remaining is residential use. Um, so I always have a little problem with what they actually want. I think I know what you actually want, but I don't think it's really the right way to get there. So what I'm saying is that the building that is proposed to be renovated meets the requirements of size, shape, and height. And it wouldn't make any difference if it was moved over four or five feet one way or the other, it would still be that size of building. So it shouldn't impact uh, existing, the other buildings in the community because it would be the same size building that they have to move. But we can't move it because we lose the driveway and carriage house. Okay, and uh, number five, the applicant has not commenced construction of the enlargement, expansion, and building of structure for some limited reduction in yard size and requests to the Board of Appeal and not considering an after the fact application. No more questions. Great, thank you. Um, one question I have is so there is, you can confirm there's no way to construct this building um, within the required setbacks of property in the lot? Um, the question is, I believe in the ordinance, Yeah, number three, I'm just wondering, like, you know, what, yeah, so was there any way to build this conforming even to maintaining it in the existing footprint and without having to come before us at all? Uh, I don't think the court says that. This is due to the physical features on the lot and the location of the existing structures on the lot. It would not be practical to construct the expansion enlargement or new structure in conformance with the appropriate value code. And what I'm saying is, we plan on using the existing foundation part of the existing building in order to save the driveway on the left side, even though we're reducing it in size, in order to get to the carriage house on the back. Now, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be practical from the owner's standpoint if we're dealing with a grandfather location to tear it all down and move it over four or five feet, which I think is going to have to be two foot eight inches. It would be impractical to do that because the avenue of the variance is available, available to save all the expense from doing that. Okay. Uh, any questions from the board at this point, Mr. Board? Yes, uh, I did have a question regarding item number four. And uh, that is, um, what is the net difference in lot coverage of all these structures? So you're, you're expanding, you make slight changes to the building itself in terms of lot <coughs> coverage. And you're eliminating the potting shed and you're putting in a carriage house. Right. Right. So, how, 
how much more coverage is that or less coverage compared to the existing coverage? Okay, the current lot has a total lot coverage of the driveway and the steps and potty shed and buildings and decks. Uh, Two thousand four hundred forty-three point six square feet. The proposed redo of the lot, if you want to call it that, including the garage house, is what we're taking out as two thousand four hundred twenty-eight point seven square feet. So, so about that reduction, we're about fifteen square feet less lot coverage. Than what's there now. And that's less than curvious? Yes, that's the curvious part. Yes, that's it. Thank you. So the reduction the, by taking out the arbor, the shed, but adding the additional footprint and adding the carriage house, you're still decreasing the amount of impervious space? Decrease. You're decreasing. By 15, 15 square feet. Okay. Yeah. I originally sent those numbers over to Brian when we did our uh, initial uh, administrative appeal in time. And at that time, I showed it was less. I think the numbers were just slightly different. It's a few square feet. And once I developed everything a little better, and everything. I redid the calculations and Brian and Paul and he said he needs to have the exact figures. And so I supplied them with those numbers and uh, the site plans to show where they came from and the uh, uh, mathematical calculations step by step. And I submitted them to Brian. I think he's still not on the picture here now. And uh, it's just to verify that it was less than what's existing. On this issue, just as we go through the plans, it looks like the main house goes from about 1,020 square feet to 1,200 square feet. We add the carriage house about 450 square feet. Um, it's not clear what we remove from the arbor and the, 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 the shed in the back, but it just is kind of counterintuitive that we're reducing the impervious site when we're the two main buildings are increasing by roughly 600 square feet versus the current coverage. Of the primary business. Um, uh, so I, we're just, I mean, I'm just reading from the plan, so I just have a mathematics who went through all that. Well, the driveway is here now, for example. <coughs> the driveway occupies uh, 1,035 square feet. And the proposed driveway is going to our, our 742 square feet. So we've got a reduction of almost 300 square feet just in the driveway. I guess the, the question I have then is there's, I think, a number of, of metrics that we use here. One is impervious coverage and one is site coverage by buildings. Um, and I'm just wondering what the site coverage by buildings from prior to the building. Well, that's really the plan. The existing building is 1,029. The closed house is going to be uh, 1,203. Plus the carriage house. Well, minus the shed in the, yeah. the earth. So that's. I didn't count the hour. I didn't even count that. So it's just minus the shed, essentially. And the crushed stone that's in, in the two on the side of it. No, no, that's not, not building. That's the, the shed would just be the building we're talking about. The shed needs to be the building. So, okay. Um, but the crushed stone were impervious <coughs> and not have to count. No, I understand. You've got two series of these the impervious coverage, and then there's building site coverage. So the building site coverage is only. <laughs> yes. Um, the other question I'd have here is the assert that it's the, um, substantially not substantially different than impacts of others. The height of the building increases somewhat dramatically, at least from the visual pictures that we got as part of the application. It looks like it's quite a bit taller. Yes, it's taller than the existing building. Well, and, and taller potentially than, than um, uh, neighboring houses. And again, I'm just doing a visual of the material provided to them. The building is being under construction right now on the left side of the property, which is just as high as this proposal. 
on the left side. Then the left side, looking from the, the, the pictures taken of the old building, not the new building that's being built now. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions from the board? Yeah, just a couple of others. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I noticed that there's a removal of a retention wall. What was the purpose of the retention wall, and why are you removing it? Okay, that comes into a couple of little, little things that we had to look at. And I'll get into a simplified, complicated idea. Okay, for a version. That existing driveway that comes all the way in from Cliff Street right now goes uphill. So everything drains to the front. From the back of the driveway to the rear property, it slopes down there. Okay? Now, when I place the carriage house, as it shows on the plan, back in that corner, okay, I'm, re I'm bringing the retaining wall out around it to the right side of the carriage house to create an area in the back of the garage that will do reduce runoff to that property because otherwise it would be four feet of exposed concrete and just a shed right up to the back line. So I bring in the retaining wall around the back. I elevated that grade slightly in the back to hold back some runoff from the roof of the carriages. Yeah. So that's the follow up to that. What impact will that have on the neighboring properties? I'm sorry? What impact will that have on the neighboring properties? Not the way it's set up, it won't. But the garage roof has a pitch from the front up to the back. So the runoff comes to the front on the driveway we run up to Cliff Street. The pitch, if it went the other way, would be putting one off onto the neighbor's front property. So I changed the roof line on that. So we can make it slow down and run off to the other's property because the carriage house is only three feet from the line. So I didn't have room to put a big drainage system to carry the roof load, so I changed the roof angle so that it wouldn't be affecting the above. Um, and then we take the shed out. The back, the shed's got a roof on it, it's pitched, it has runoff coming the rain, hitting the ground right away. So, by moving the retaining wall around the garage, taking the potting shed out, I'm trying to create a better area out back to cut back into town and the runoff that may occur to the rear property. Great, thank you. Any further questions from the board? <laughs> I just have one clarifying question. It seemed like all of the variance requests that we were looking at here relate to the main house. Are they not associated with the carriage house? Is the new building located on the front? The carriage house is as proposed to some of the I can't hear you, Brian. The carriage house, as proposed, is in compliance with the Higgins Beach character code. The variance does not. Uh, it does not apply to the carriage house. And that's existing? No, the proposed no. carriage house. Yeah, in blue there, okay. Everything in blue is new. Blue is new. Yeah, I think Ryan could explain that. On the carriage house, I hit the beach, you only have to be three feet from the sideline and three feet from the rear line. So that's the Higgins Beach Road. It's a separate, it's a, a separate code in the beach. I mean, I started reading the rules, but then I got this. This is crazy. I just have fun. It's so easy. I don't understand why you can't get it. All right. So the key here, though, is it has been reviewed and approved as being a merger with Higgins Beach Code. Yes. All right. So that's very important. Yeah. Everybody understand. Yeah, that can be a finding of fact on this. Yeah. Um, Shelly, you had a question? Yeah, and I don't know if this is going to get me anywhere, but it is a fair complete. Clarification question. This um, in this picture right here, we see all these electrical lines. Power lines, work, yeah. power lines thank you. Um, is that going to impact your building? Is going to impact those in any way? Since it is coming forward, the building's not coming forward. It's staying right is, where it is. But yeah, the face of the building will stay. And okay, there I are, think so. That was maybe my one of my problems. Let's so kind of answer your question about the telephone pole. Well, since those pictures were taken, the new telephone pole was put in right beside the existing one we see it now. And uh, the house next door, as well as this owner, they're trying to get together the two other owners. 
to eliminate the telephone poles in the underground on the rest of the street. But that hasn't been determined yet yeah. because the CP has to get information from us and all that. Thank you. So that's the plan. Great. Sure. I've got a couple of uh, questions, clarifying questions. Um, <clears throat> the first one uh, going back to the impervious uh, surfaces uh, and looking at the plans provided. Both like the shed to the rear um, is being removed, uh, and then a portion of the existing uh, paved area driveway is uh, being reduced. Yep. Um, are those areas that are being removed uh, and not replaced or reused going to be uh, covered in any way, revegetated? Yes. Yes. Okay. That was one question. Uh, second one goes back to the question of uh, the carriage and the applicability for the variance today um, as a separate. Um, so I think it's speech uh, review. Um, are there any uh, elements of the rear um, rear stone? Apologize, um, but uh, uh, the retaining walls of the rear of the property that have any um, in relation to the variance itself that uh, before us tonight? The retaining walls of the rear that's being relocated. It's not part of the variance. Okay, just check. Um, and the third part, uh, part of the requested variance, there was a note about uh, for the front side of it, I think at the second floor, eight, uh, eight foot um, is what is requested. Is that what is existing from the, the front property to the street or the property line? Okay, let's get into the one to get into the trust of the variances. The um, reason why is a clarification. I think there was a statement earlier that the front phase isn't changing. That's why I asked. The front of the existing building is four foot two inches on the front. Okay. The required setback for the main mass of the building is 18 feet. That is the proposed cable on the second floor, which will be only 10 feet on the eighth. So, I'm asking for an eight foot reduction in the front of that setback in order to put the second floor cable wall over the existing house. Okay. With that, they're proposing a deck balcony over the extension that goes towards Cliff Street. And we're proposing a six foot wide by an 18 foot long. Got 18 foot long deck over the front of the building. The character code requires length of five feet. So I'm asking for a one foot extension for the deck to go on the second floor. Over the so that's what that reference is for. Um, the first floor of the building doesn't need a variance because of the grandfather. So I'm only looking at the second floor gable and the second floor balcony in the front of the house. Now on the right hand side of the house, the uh, existing building is going to have an extension to the house, to the rear, by 12 feet. And that is going to be, I put down five foot four inches because that's the closest place to the building will be because it's not quite parallel to the one. Okay. So that's going to be a five foot four setback on the front on the right side of the house instead of the required eight. So I'm looking for a two foot eight variance in order to take I gotta explain this. If you look at the picture of the proposed building, the gable now faces the street. Whereas the existing building the gable space the sidelines. Under the Higgins Beach character code, the gable end of the house has to be the narrowest portion of the building. So the building's 28 feet wide, and adding 12 feet to the rear makes it 38 feet deep, so the gable has to face the street. So we have to change the configuration of the roof. Now, in order to do that and change the configuration and get the second floor of the roof, we have to extend the variance on the right side up to cover 
that vertical expansion on the house. So that second floor is going to be five foot four inches from the line, the closest point. So we're looking for a two foot eight variance for the second floor change. Complicating that, the ordinance of Higgins Beach requires that any roof government, regardless of the location of the building on the lot, has to be set back 12 feet from the lot line. So that little dormer up in the attic on the right hand side needs a variance to be constructed seven foot four inches from the lot. So we're looking for a variance there of four foot eight inches to put that little bathroom dormer on it in the attic. And that's finished attic, right? Yes. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Not not meant as a bedroom, not as long as the better I think it is just an attic for storage. No. No. Uh, the floor plan show is yeah. going to be bedroom in the Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to have a bedroom up here. We're going to have a uh, center family room. And there's going to be a bathroom and yeah. a mechanical area and some storage space. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Go on. Now, the donors on the other side of the house don't have to, they need to control the center. But there's other problems with those dogs over there because the roof pitch has to be 6 12 and so forth. And then I got to take and jog it in, put it the roof over the pilot. But that all needs to carry it. But the only dog that had the variance request to the board is the right hand side dog on the third floor. So basically, what we're looking for is on the right hand side, five foot four setback, we need the two foot eight variance. First floor, second floor, cable in. The donor on the right hand side needs a seven foot four setback request variance to put the donor in. The other, the other request for variance is the front gable setback 10 feet from the street and the porch one foot wide. These are the one foot variance is needed for the porch. So that's basically what we're looking for. All the rest of the property and everything meet the requirements. So just to uh, summarize what you're saying there, all the various that you are requesting are things which we can't authorize by code. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Part of these, Chair, so I know at um, previous meetings there was uh, the ability to use Google Street View just to walk or see some of the uh, adjacent properties. I don't know if that's something that could be pulled up to see. Please go ahead. If it doesn't go down the question. Oh, okay. I don't think it does. It no. stops in the floor. It stops. The problem we're having is for some reason this computer doesn't want to. It's, see what the screen looks like? Yeah. It's like a negative. It's like the person. That is a little bit weird. Uh, I don't know how to fix it. I can confirm, Rudy, that the, I can confirm that the street view is, it doesn't work here. I'm the thing. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments from the board? Yes, but in this release, it, and this is a squirrely one, it's a question too. Um, the, um, uh, enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties in the other counties you can understand. But this is just for the main property, it's not the carriage house that, that's covered. Um, I guess, I'm, are there qualities of the current house that make it difficult to enjoy the property, such that this expansion or this renovation is a requirement? To make the house, you know, usable for the next X number of years, or, um, or is this discretionary? No, it's not discretionary from the standpoint of the existing house. Uh, if you look at the floor plan, if you look at the size of the kitchen. Uh, that's just that it's not a modern kitchen. It's almost unusual. The width of the hallways is less than building code. The rise in one of the stairs is less than building. The first little bathroom is very small. It's a smaller head for the pocket to get in and out of the bathroom. Um, there are other deficiencies structurally that we can deal with too. Uh, the second floor has got three bedrooms. If you look at them, they're only nine foot eight, nine foot five inches wide, eight foot six inches wide, and eight foot eight, eight foot eight, eight, foot eight, eight, foot eight inches wide. And they run back to the side by side. By side. And it's only serviced by one small bathroom in the shower. So, 
in this day when it was done and remodeled, it was probably fine. Okay. Today, those deficiencies, they got to be corrected. They got they to right today. Uh, and I say not right. Uh, they're not aesthetically appealing. And they have structural problems. And they have dimensional problems in sight. And to re rehab this with just the frame that's got there now would be impossible to do because of the way the roof is a double break on the roof wrap. The, the dorm is on the front and rear. It's totally a two shot. They put it in the egress windows. There's a lot of problems. Other questions? Um, Perfect. There's the top. Go uh, ahead. Have there been any considerations on planting to the right side of the property where the roof is not going to close to the neighbor? Which, which piece now? Um, so, Brooks Street straight facing the property, um, I think to the right of the building, mm -hmm. that um, have written our request of reduction. Right. Well, that's like six foot wide in the front, and five foot full in the back. And then within that distance, you can deviate the grading enough to help on the property. And the carriage house is only three feet, so and it's all grass and everything. And uh, I don't see that as any problem any more than uh, any of the houses down there that are done. And the owners probably go to put the main gutters on anyway. We hate it. We hate it. Any further? Okay. Thank you, Walt. Um, at this time, I am going to open the floor for public comment. If there is anyone from the floor that would like to speak, please come to the podium, state your name, who you represent, your address, and uh, why you're here. My name is David Glory. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, I've been practicing for almost 50 years, mainly frequently doing land use law and corporation council of Portland. I've worked in a number of towns. I was here before this board. I think it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago, maybe Lamb kept me out on something where uh, uh, staff needed correction and we in fact put it in correctively as to the zoning analysis. Uh, I'd like to, if I could, under the statute, witnesses uh, before boards of appeals are subject to cross examination through the chair or however you want to handle it. I have some questions I'd like to ask Mr. Wilson, and then I'd like my clients and any other members of the public to go forward and give information to the board, testify to the board, and then at the end I'd like to sum up uh, for the opponents on this issue, if, if that's acceptable to you. Right now I, I wanted to ask Mr. Wilson some questions first to so follow up on the questions that the board asked him because uh, uh, some of his uh, responses, I think, uh, need further elaboration. Before you go further, just, yeah. just one moment, Ms. Lowry. Sure. Um, will you allow us to cross-examination? Uh, the statute says you have to, uh, excuse me, in the case of peace law on it. I think the, I think any questions that anyone in public in public <coughs> comments have can be asked through you. You can make it out of those questions. You can ask the questions in order, and then we can call Mr. Wilson back up to to respond. Okay, but, could, could, well, but, but it's not going to be a back and forth. It takes yes, long. It's yeah, we're we're not. We're, 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 I will give you I will give you your opportunity to ask the questions that you would like to ask for Mr. Wilson, and. Um, I will give Ms. Wilson a chance to answer them at the end. I want to interrupt for just a second. Do we need to change any tape or anything? This has gone like two hours already, and I've said it would be over with an hour. So. <laughs> and the Celtics tip off anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hurry this along. Yeah, no, Please, so, Mr. Chair? Yes. I guess, Mr. Roy, could you just clarify, are you speaking as a member of the public? Or are you speaking as a representative for others? Um, you normally have people give their address, and I just understand, yeah, so what you're, what, how you're addressing us. What is your connection? Yeah. Yes, I'm a lawyer for 
uh, the Shapiro's, the, uh, the Mercer's, and the Rabbits. And are these direct others? They are. They're okay. behind, uh, behind this property. Right. And uh, I, um, yes, uh, I will give you my questions. Hopefully, you'll ask. They'll answer them now or whatever, uh, rather than at the end after the public comments. Whatever. I think that it would be helpful if he asked if he answered them up front, since he's already given his position on some of these ideas. I have here the um, uh, computations, which were done as a square footage, that I got from Brian uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, and I'll we'll add a caveat that those were the initial computations that were supplied for the preliminary. I understand. Yeah. I just wanted to quit. But this is just to aid him in refreshing his recollection on some of these things. So, um, well, why don't we get started and ask your questions, Mr. Lowry? I'll, I'll note them down as best I can, and I'm sure I'll we'll be listening as well. And uh, give other folks a member of the public a chance to answer, and we'll all address them at the end. That's how we'll do this. We will answer them at the end. I'm sorry. Once all folks have had a chance to give their public comment, I'll ask Mr. Wall to answer your questions. All right. Um, I've asked him first of all, what is the basis? Is where in the ordinance does it say anywhere that you can remove structures or impervious surface objects? and claim credit for the removal. Uh, and whether he's familiar with the shoreland zoning article 12C, which deals with non-conforming structures, and which says, if a non-conforming building or structure is demolished or removed by its owner, it shall be rebuilt and replaced. It shall not be rebuilt or replaced except in conformity with the requirements of section 15B of this ordinance unless a variance is granted by the Board of Appeals pursuant to section 16 d 2 when you, when you remove a structure, if it's non-conforming and the lot size, uh, sorry, lot coverage requirement here is 35% of the lot, same thing as impervious service, or some of this ordinance, uh, it's gone if you remove it owner takes it up, and he's like the seniority points, and my client lost their porch because they took it down and didn't, uh, didn't replace it fast enough. And I didn't even sell that. They were doing something else and they raised the building up. But the, uh, the bottom line is you can't move around your grandfather and fungibly, particularly under, under the uh, ordinance that you have, which says, says it twice, in the Shoreland Overlay District, when the property is also located in the Coastal Residential CD, CR1 District, or the Coastal Mixed Limited uh, CD, CL, CL, CML District, the total footprint area shall not exceed 35% of the lot a portion thereof located within the showland zone, including land previously developed. You don't get credit for grandfather, your grandfather's area, and you can't just move it around. If you, you know, you, you have what's grandfathered in place, you can't take out uh, the uh, potting shed, for example, and claim credit for that square footage in order to put up a carriage house or anything else for that matter. You drop back to the 35 foot maximum or whatever is grandfathered that remains. But you, you can't just use that, uh, it's at 48% right now, uh, according to his calculations. So those are preliminary calculations. It's at 48.8%, uh, yeah, 48.8%. 81, yeah, 0.81%. That's what it is right now. 
and you can only go down from there. You cannot increase the lot nonconformity uh, by doing new construction. In the case of new construction, you can only go down. Uh, is there a question? Uh, is there a question here? Let's get the questions going. The board does not need a lecture. Let's get the questions that you want to have answered. Let's get those out. Oh can we do that? Whether we're going to be that. here all night with this. We don't need a lecture on the ordinance. We need questions. So well, you are wrong and you're not. No, I'm correct. I'm been absolutely correct. Ask your questions, please. Ask your questions. I was asking whether he's familiar with those provisions. And Mr. Why Chair, we need to move this along. Oh, I, I understand. Ask the question. I, I would ask that you please ask the question. All right. The carriage house. Uh, the roof extensions. Uh, there are places where the roof extends further uh, out than it does currently. It's uh, under the ordinance. I'm asking whether he is familiar with the ordinance which says the definition of impervious surface includes roofs and old roof overhangs, whether he calculated or not. It's obvious that he did not. Um, on the use of the new structures which are proposed, one is an enlargement and then the carriage house, both of them, he assumes that they're going to be residential as opposed to short-term rental or commercial in nature, uh, which is very likely in the current market. Okay. I'm asking whether that isn't a, what's the basis for that assumption that the use will be purely residential, just like other properties in the area. Another one that I'd like him to answer is, uh, he said that uh, they would use the existing foundation and of the house. Uh, my best understanding is that the house sits on cinder blocks. Uh, and is that correct? Is there a foundation under there at all to be used? Um, Save the rest of my speech later on. Thank you. You better do it now. Sir? You better do it. If you've got a speech, you better make it now. Okay. The public, the public comment is your, is your time to say everything that you're going to say. That once the public comment is over, there won't be any further comment. The comment will strictly be within the board itself. Okay. Is there, uh, do you have further questions? I have four questions yes. here. Is there anything further? Um, I'd like him to identify these uh, sheets, which are the, albeit preliminary um, computations, which show that the uh, lot coverage is currently 48.4%, uh, and uh, the proposed, at that time anyway, and we can talk about uh, any difference, and then and now, uh, it, uh, it was 48.81 percent before, and now it's going to be 48.4 percent. And the existing footprint um, is supposedly reduced by uh, about 20 percent. Sorry, 20 square feet. Uh, but this does not, in fact show what's on the plan, which has to do with the retaining walls. The, re the existing retaining walls are presumably being removed, or at least some of them are presumably being 
removed. Uh, the, the new retained wall areas are far greater, and it's likely that there are more than 20, 20 is it 26.5? It's hard to read on this thing because of the copy. It's either 20, or maybe you can explain whether it's 20.28 20 or 26.28 square feet. Uh, and he can uh, explain a why in his computation here he hasn't uh, accounted for the change in the uh, retaining wall sizes, which would definitely be a pervious surface. Uh, yeah, the grandfathering provisions in the shoreland zone are actually very limited. Uh, and they, there is no basis in the ordinance whatsoever for taking or removing existing impervious surface and uh, taking credit for it in excess of the 35 feet, taking credit for it elsewhere. And if you have your grandfather where it is, in the case of the new buildings, like the carriage house, well, like some of these extensions, um, you don't get that under this ordinance, because once you remove it, it's gone. Is there a question here, Salari? No, I'm making my presentation. Sorry. Go ahead. And this is fundamentally wrong under the ordinance. There is no basis for doing that under the ordinance. And there are two or three provisions which say you can't do it. Well, implicitly say you can't do it. And I don't know why this application got here because, in fact, the lot coverage right now 48 percent is far more than 35 percent which is the maximum allowed and uh, i can't increase by one inch including roof overhangs and so forth but those are also within the definition of pretty surface under the ordinance um, yeah although the presentation the written presentation talks about the potting shed as if it's a garage. It is a potting shed. I think that was conceded now. And uh, this is not really replacing a garage with a garage. Uh, there's also an interesting question about the use of this lot. Um, it says in the Coastal Residence 1 district, we're allowed to have only one a single family detached dwelling and accessory structure. That's what you get. In fact, and, and the, the uh, design drawings in that ordinance show and speak uh, to a one story garage. Now, it seems to me the way the roof is going now. It's, it sounds like a shed roof, the way it's described. You know, it's going to shed the water toward, it's toward the ocean, and not back to my client's problems, which my client's properties, where you can see, they'll show you pictures of the problem that they're currently having back there, which is going to be exacerbated by this development. The, um, it sounds like it's going to be a shed roof, but I understand that uh, it's plain that it's going to be one and a half carriage house, one and a half roof carriage house, which could accommodate uh, a, uh, as I said before, a uh, uh, short term rental. I mean, it's a dwelling unit. It's being proposed as a dwelling unit in the carriage house. And that's not allowed. You can't have two dwelling units. On a property in this in the zone. It's a non-starter, as I said before. I don't understand how this got here. Um, finally, yeah, it's technically a growing unit in the mixed-use building, 
is what they're saying it's going to be because it's going to be a garage and it's going to be a dwelling unit above it you know, whatever this uh, roof structure ends up being uh, it doesn't look like the drawings uh, of what is supposed to be in this zone the typical drawing there are typical drawings in this uh, special zoning area and this the description that was just given isn't one of them and uh, we now know that the, there's an admission before the gables come out on the second floor and the uh, there's a balcony and deck on the second floor as well uh, both of which act in the impervious area the definition of impervious area. It is because it keeps the water from going down into the soil. Extend it out, it's going to run off faster. And that's the definition in the ordinance itself. The impervious surface. That's what roots among other things. And uh, that's true of all of the extensions that they're talking about uh, in the Drop. They all increase the uh, uh, black coverage or impervious surface, even if he was right. And I don't think he is. I know he's not. In fact, the ordinance. Are you laughing, Brian? Are you laughing? Sorry. You screwed up the last time I was here, and you have to ask the town attorney. Excuse me. Yeah. So, Larry, we're not here to talk uh, about no. anything in the past right now. We're here to talk about this application. So please state what you are going to say. I'm going to All right. And it's obvious he's become an advocate. He's not here. And that, that's not proper with an administrative agency. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to speak? Yes. Is Mr. Walter responding? Did you see the public? Maybe we can the public first. I wanted to go to the public first. Okay, because they have questions first. Yeah. So, would oh, anyone? I recommend we take a three minute break. Sure. sure. Okay, folks, we're going to take a, just a quick three minute bathroom break. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Everybody has to use the restroom. Please go for it. Go back in three minutes. Yeah, we sit in front of the yeah, so, right. so which side do you want? Uh, elevation. He's a good The side that faces five foot trees. Yeah, they're all right here. That would be, oh yeah, that's right. They just don't have to be the Well, it's all right. This guy was this is the left. Uh, uh, that was the right. So, no, it's this side right here. Yeah. This one. This one. Yeah. I'll see if I can get it out there. Yeah. 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 I don't think what I was looking at. Don't do the large diagram. Get a medium or something, not large. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, no, we moved all around. We, moved, we were in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and we were in Gainesville, uh, Florida. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was great. It was great. We were four at that hour, so it was hard. But it was beautiful. They cut the swamp for a reason. Um, but uh, it was a good time to be there in our lives. So it was nice. I was one of the background. Like, it was one of the positions for the football team. So that was pretty cool. We got to be on the sidelines. Well, he got to be on the sidelines. I got to be on the So um, it was like the whole like setup for it. Was, yeah. Are you from me? No. Where are you from? Oh, we went back to my family, but an hour away from here. So, uh, uh, oh, cool. so we are not going to be with them. He wanted to be with them. We only looked at two of them. We were on the hospital. So, we got down to the We really, we only looked at two of them. We were on the hospital. We were on is, I don't know, 20 something else. Yeah. Uh, okay, folks. Yeah. 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 Who would like to speak next? Uh, the public uh, forum is still open. Whoever would like to take a stand. Just tell us your name, your address, and what you would like to say. We're not going to keep any hard time deadlines right now, but we ask that you please be concise. Okay. My name is Nancy Barry. I'm the co-owner of the college at Bond Cliff Street. The other co-owner is also here this evening, and he is my cousin, David McCann. I have concerns, of course, about the proposed construction. This is right next to us, of course, at number seven. So this directly, directly impacts us. I have comments in writing, and I was wondering, could I pass those out to you? We actually have. Right we have. I think that's what we're supposed to do. I didn't know there was going to be so many of you, so I don't have enough. So we actually all we have. Yeah, we did. Yeah, they were printed off. I don't think. No, this is a different set. This is a different set. Oh, that's the different one. Since I'm ready. Which one? This is the property. Right to the left. Where are going to be on the right? The right. Yeah. Sorry, I had to turn myself. You have to figure that out. All right, thank so, you, Nancy. I'm sorry? Thank you, Nancy. Oh, you're very welcome. And sorry, I don't have enough copies. It's okay. This is what you're going to hear regarding that share. Our concern is our first concern, and of course, the biggest one is the cottages at 5 and 7 Fifth Street are very close together. <clears throat> at their nearest borders, there is only 31 and a half inches of distance between the houses. This obviously is before zoning. Beyond the bump out addition towards the back of the houses, the distance increases to about six feet. There is a larger distance between the houses as you move towards the front of both houses. As shown in the picture that is part of this you know, these comments, the proximity of these houses have created problems with rain, water runoff, 
snow accumulation, including drift and snow, and snow and ice falling from both cottage roofs. There is potential for damage to both cottages, but to ours in particular, because we have starting and not a cinder block foundation like our neighbor. Water has flowed and collected under our cottage for years and has caused damage to our support columns and cells that have to be removed and replaced. We installed skirting to try to increase the airflow to dry out underneath our cottage. Water still collects, but the airflow is able to evaporate it eventually. However, the longer the water remains under the cottage, the more damage it causes. And obviously, over time, the damage is cumulative. Our concern is that the new house construction will exacerbate the water situation under our cottage. We have the situation now. It has not gone away. And of course, with the new construction, we have a fear that it's just going to get worse. We ask that the required eight-foot distance from the property line be used for no shorter areas given. It would help mitigate the damage done by seeping, flowing, and collecting water. It would allow more space between the cottages and allow more land to absorb the water. It also would allow more space in case of call upon snow and ice from our roof and the three-story roof that's going to be next door. Number two, this is more like a common. Are there any plans to have a new foundation for that new construction and not just for the 12 by 28 addition in the back? We assume that the new construction is going to have its own foundation, so it's going to be new. With that construction, could drain tile be installed in the back and along the east side of the cottage to help manage rain and snow melt water? So tonight, my cousin thought he heard a comment by Mr. Wilson that raises a few more concerns for us regarding foundation. We thought we heard that there's going to be a change in the gradient. There's going to be deviated grading around this new construction or this house to help with runoff. And I, I need I need to know if that is what I heard or what he heard because, and this is going to be a question that I would like to have at least looked at, if the gradient around that foundation is changed, where is that water runoff going? And I can guess where it's going. It's going to go right onto our property. So if there's an actual proposal to change that gradient already thought of, to control and help run off, then we're going to get it, and that is just going to add to our concerns. We've got enough problems as it is without anything else being added to it. Concern number three from some more comments. In the back of 75th Street, the land slope towards the property, and I tried to take a picture so you could see the slope. The 28 by 12 foot addition plus porch plus the Bilco unit, plus the carriage house, we feel will result in about 832 square feet of land that is no longer available for absorbing water. The loss of land for absorption, with the loss of land for absorption, there's a good possibility of an increase of water flowing and seeping onto the property, leading to flooding and more water in the our cottage. Our concern is the neighbor's large house footprint will impact the management of water flowing one yard to another. Currently, the water flooding situation is not considered under control. It always needs our observation and remediation. With the proposed changes to the property next door, we firmly believe the water flooding issue will worsen considerably. Last point. Our property floods periodically. The back of our cottage is in the middle of the picture, and that's included on this comments. And the 75th Street neighbors to the right. 
In certain years, the water was covered with cement slab by our steps and the first wooden step on our stairs. The little tiny stairs in the were kind of like the top part of that picture, way in the distance. And at that level, of course, the water has gone underneath the cottage and flooded it. Our concern is that the neighbors proposed rear addition, carriage house, and retaining wall relocation will make the flooding worse. Could the addition be made smaller? Could the carriage house be made slower, or smaller? Again, to address the, the topic of, of soil retaining water. Can any act can any action by anybody, the town, anybody be suggested to address the flooding? We included the picture that was taken by our backyard by a neighbor after a rainstorm last year. In conclusion, we had great concerns regarding the water runoff and water seepage coming from our neighbor's property and the water damage that will occur to our cottage. Thank you to the Lord for the opportunity to address the zoning board and for your consideration. Sign the co-owners of Francis Street. Any questions? Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anyone Thank else you. for the public would like to speak? My name is Jane Yabbitt. My sister Catherine Mercier and I own 14 Forest Street, <clears throat> excuse me, which is directly in back of 7 Cruz Street. And just a brief history about our ownership and launch editor in its speech. Our parents purchased uh, this property in 1959, they used it as a summer place in 63, and then they decided to move year round. So we grew up, went to Scarborough High School, and we graduated from Scarborough High. When we were growing up, the town was approximately 6,000 people, and the beach community was primarily summer residents. It's just, there was just a handful of year round residents at Higgins Beach at that time. You can all see how much Scarborough has changed, and so has our human speech. Our cottage dated back to 1897, and in 2008, we inherited it from my mother. We tried to put a new roof on it. It was balloon construction, and our builder said it wouldn't support the weight of a new roof. So, I very much understand the old cottages and how people want to remodel them and improve their properties. We all want to enjoy our properties to the fullest at Davis Beach because we love our beach. Um, we had to tear down our cottage in 2011. <clears throat> at that time, the restrictions were far different. We had to be 30 feet from the road and 15 feet on each side. Fortunately, our lot was like 100 by 150, but we have a third of it that lies in the shore zone that is unbuilt, unbuildable due to wetness and flooding and water drainage. We built before the Higgins Code was established and we met all the requirements without asking for any variance, but it didn't allow us any space to build a, a garage or a carriage and wouldn't we all like to have that? We have eight abutting neighbors to our property and we've always had good relations with all of them. We all are concerned about the drainage and the pond that forms when there's at least two inches of rain and my husband will address the pond. The previous owner to Seven Cliff Street were always considerate of our view. They never put anything to obstruct our view was the water, she put her cottage, her potting shed at the back of her property, and if anything, she took down trees, which improved our view. Um, when we came to the beach last Thanksgiving, 2020, uh, 2021, there was a surveyor's marker in the middle of our yard, down between us and Seven Cliff. And I had to investigate with all the neighbors to find out why this marker was there. And we found out that 
it belonged to the surveyor that did Seven Cliff Street. And it was probably a mistake. So I had to call and have them come remove it. But we had no contact with the new owners. I never met them. So I totally understand replacing this 100-year-old cottage of theirs. And they have guidelines for 50 by 100 lot. Plus, they're in the shore zone. So many houses on the beach have been redone with that same um, 50 by 100 lot and have tried to stay within the character code. There are a number of variances being asked for this cottage. Um, they're not within the boundary guidelines, the character codes for their lot size, and the shore zone. The big surprise was when we actually saw the plans last week uh, that there was a proposed carriage house. And this is a large carriage house, not just a small garage. And there was no mention of that in the initial notification that we got from the town. They were just telling us that there was a 28 by 12 addition to their house. No carriage house was mentioned. So I find this very large carriage house to be more of a second living space with plumbing, heating, bathroom, shower, possibly a kitchen at some point, who knows. It's placed in the direct view of the ocean that we and my neighbor share. And we've had that view for over 60 years. And <clears throat> um, the most, one of the most concerning factors too is the impact on the property and the buildup of land for this carriage house. Um, you're going to have to put a foundation and probably a cement floor so there's we assume that this uh, major buildup of land um, will have to support that foundation. So now you've got retaining walls, and then they also show railroad tie walls. And I don't know how high those are going to be end up being. So the lot coverage is now greater. The size of the carriage house is twice the size of their potting shed. Plus, you have a larger house on the property, a paved driveway, far less land for water to be absorbed. So this is a great concern to all of us who surround this property. The town has never been able to solve the drainage problem, and we have lived there for so long that I can say that we did not have a severe water problem until the last 20 years. I hope that the board will not allow the two-year round of two year round living structures on one small 50 by 100 lot and will follow the codes that they set forth for the construction of the main house. Please consider our water problem and we would like to keep our view of the ocean and keep the value of our property. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak? Yeah, my name is Paul Rabbit. Most people know me as Peter Rabbit, and I'm the spouse of uh, Jane Rabbit, uh, one of my co owners with uh, my sister Warren Kathy. Um, I got some pictures here. They, you know, we've been looking at sketches and what have you, but I've got uh, these pictures, pictures of the house that uh, what did I give you to. Okay. That's. Uh, Nine cliff, seven cliff, and nine cliff. And then there is, these are the some pictures of the the distance between five cliff and seven cliff. And you can see the uh, cinder block foundation here. Some the, more pictures of that. And I'm just going to hold up these before I get to it. Okay, I wanted to discuss the uh, stormwater situation. Over the years, there's been development on that end of the beach, our end of the beach. Uh, property owners have built up their land so that uh, they would have flat yards and elevations and storm runoff. In the mid-80s, three houses were built down on Forest Street. And it was built in a, what we would call a bog. What are they building houses down here in the bog? That's where, that's where the uh, runoff from 
the hill up on Piper Shores would uh, collect. Then in the, and then in the 90s, the private estate on Piper Road was built, and later Piper Shores was built. This, that began a stormwater problem for us and our neighbors. At the time, our property was overgrown with uh, the back property that abuts uh, the, the subject property here. It was overgrown with bamboo, knockweed, bittersweet, alders, blowdowns, stumps, and everything. It was, uh, it was not maintained. It was the property was so big that our elderly, their elderly parents couldn't maintain it properly. So it, they let the back be just for a while. We began to clean it up. My brother and I began to clean it up in the early 2000s. When we got down to the back of the property, we found a hole in the ground. Somebody dug a hole, and we found a broken clay tile pipe in that hole and water running through it. The clay tile was like eight inch bell end tubing, uh, three or four feet long. It turns out it's the old sewer line that runs from one end of the beach all the way down to the river, the, septic, the old septic tank in the river. And it's being used as a uh, stormwater drain. The, um, as you go through the different streets, you get to the low part of the streets that there are um, uh, drains in the streets. They go into this eight inch pipe and, and go down to the river. We, at the time, the, uh, the neighbors, the, um, the shears that own the house, that, uh, the, the subject house, told me about the stormwater issue and that the, the hole was the only way to drain the water. We contacted Mike Shaw, um, Public Works, about the situation. He came out and said nothing you can do about it because it's on private land. He advised me what to do. Uh, get some plastic pipe, get a T and a grate, and dig out the broken tile and put this in with the T and the grate on top so you, you'd have uh, a drain, natural or a proper drain for the water to, uh, to go out. They also tried to run a robot down the camera, down the pipe with the camera, uh, but it got hung up. Uh, so they had to pull it back. They then put dye in the pipe, and they did find it coming out of the river. So they knew the pipe was clear all the way through. Okay, so let me just give you the rest of these pictures. That's the drain I put in. This is it again with the, uh, I put a, uh, a driveway marker there so I could find it. And then when we do have flooding, this is what it looks like. And you get to see the back of the, of the property. The back of our property that abuts uh, seven, seven foot street and five foot street. We get this pond, every time we have two inches of rain in a short period of time, it stays there about six to eight hours after the rain flows, the rain and the flow stops, and then it finally drains out depending upon the tide down the river. The worst I've seen is water up to the back steps of McCann property, and also up to the steps next to the uh, potting shed on uh, the, the subject property. We rely on that old sewer line to, to uh, keep us from having a disaster. Mike Shaw told the previous owner that they, I assume they being the town, require any construction or, act, or excavation on the property over the sewer line uh, to replace the, the clay tile with plastic. Now, I don't know if that's you know, codified in something, so when somebody tears down it, it does excavation on their property, it tears down it, you know, an old dodge and builds a new one, whether they have this clay tile goes to it, they have to replace it, that is codified now? Um, they try to do it as we go all that. Yeah. So if somebody redevelops, we try to replace those sections. Yeah. If, if, if they don't want to replace those sections, we at least try to get an easement for the town so we can go in later and do that if they don't want to do it. Okay. We give them the option. And that's, it's, it's totally voluntary. We're not mandating anybody to do anything. We're asking for easements and asking to replace that. Well, well, so far we have had a problem, and it's been, I know there's been three uh, cottages in the last couple of years that were over the, the sewer line that they did do the right thing. But the bigger fear is some property owner has no idea what he's doing, just digs a hole, sees the pipe, and breaks it, and doesn't know what he, he broke it, and next thing, the, the sewer line is back, the water's backed up. And the problem with that is, is that 
uh, you know, the water keeps building up and building up because there's a place to drain, and then it's going to start flowing. And it's going to flow out where it wants to go. It's going to go through out to Five Cliff Street, Three Cliff Street, down to One Cliff Street, maybe even over to Hope Street. It, that's where the, the land slopes down that way. So you're going to have a number of houses that, that could be damaged if something happens to the sewer line based on the problem we have. Now this brings me to the, the current situation. You want to replace a 100 square foot spawning shed with a 400 square foot carriage house. This is going to add obviously lot coverage and it was the rain water will not be able to be absorbed into the ground. They're also talking about a retaining wall. You know, they mentioned the existing retaining wall. You can see it in the pictures there. It's just a, uh, you know, flat, flat stone. And they, um, also, the, the, that area is the uh, it floods. You can see the water in there, and it's it was the previous owner's garden, so it was a you know natural absorption of water there. Now in this this plan here, they want to fill that in with, with uh, uh, obviously you know a, a retaining wall, a big retaining wall, fill it in with with dirt, cover it with uh, the foundation and the cement floor. And it's just over the, it's going to be right where the perfect place is now for the water to be absorbed. And it's going to shift it over to the other side of the property to the, looking at it from the back to the left side of the property, which is more of the ledge. So the water is not going to seep into that and then flow into the McCann property at uh, Five Bush Street. Now I know the rebuttal will be, I've been heard it already, that you know, engineers are going to design gutters and downspouts and culverts and will slope the land so the water doesn't drain into various properties. And that may be good for the first few years, but eventually, after the engineers leave, the property owners are gonna to have to maintain, repair, ensure that the drainage is working properly. And even keeping it from getting clogged with ice in the winter. You know, I, I just don't see that being a, a priority for any future property owner. How many of you clean your gutters every year? Make sure that, you know, nobody does that. Eventually, <laughs> sorry. Eventually, water will go where it wants to wants to go, regardless of where the engineer tells it to. So that's uh, that's all. Any questions on any of the pictures or anything? No. Thank you for providing. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Uh, Good morning. Thanks for giving us a chance to share. Our concerns and my, my comments will be very brief, very brief, uh, and may not be something that, that will occur to you to bring into your consideration. But I wanted to say that, that Nancy and I are in the third generation of our family to be there at Five Fifth Street, and we want to do our very best to make sure that the place stays there for other people in our family. The family are the folks who use it. And there are now four and five generations more. And, and we're hoping that our concerns about the shape and the water and the other things will be in your thoughts too. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Mercier, and I own a home at 14 Forest Street with my sister, Jenny Mabbitt. My family is only the second owner of our property since it passed from the Higgins family. So we are very invested in our neighborhood and community, having grown up as year-round residents. I'm concerned about the proposal for Southern Cliff Street. I agree with the comments regarding increased lot coverage, requested variances, as well as the possible effects to the ongoing water problem in our neighborhood. In my reading of the Higgins Beach character-based zoning district's guidelines, under general provisions, it states to preserve and enhance the existing character of Higgins Beach, respects the existing built form, and honors the historic development pattern inherent in the original plan of Higgins Beach. The proposal does not feel like that, that honors this guideline. Historically, most lots were built with one structure for living space and perhaps a small single garage. In 2015, I understood the creation of the character code was to help those who were on 50 by 100 lots by relaxing setbacks in order to have a longer, narrower structure 
and still maintain an appearance that fit in our community. The proposed plan asks for several variances rather than use the guidelines for new construction. I understand that old houses are difficult to restore, therefore I assume most of the existing structure will be replaced, but uh, closer to the side lines than the eight feet required. The request states that the house will be built upon the existing foundation, which is cinder block. Uh, the carriage house is a new structure, which does not seem to be a necessity, and does not replace the current structure. The proposal re refers to an existing detached garage, which is in fact a garden potting shed. The misrepresentation in the description is confusing. The request for additional coverage seems to exceed the 35% maximum allowed. In addition, the carriage house, which is intended to provide additional living space, is placed directly in my view of the ocean. The additional coverage required by adding more structure, building up the land, and adding larger retaining walls, as well as the elimination of vegetation on the lot, stands to add to the current drainage issue as my brother-in-law described. In, re in reading about the management of stormwater runoff on the EPA and Maine.gov websites, the use of vegetation to absorb the water and reducing coverage of land with impervious surfaces is important. The larger building structures with more roof areas also contribute to the runoff problem. Higgins Beach is a highly developed area where low impact building practices should be considered. The pond that forms in our backyard after heavy rain has become worse and more frequent over the past years. When I received the card regarding tonight's meeting, it was the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. The card made no mention of a large carriage house, only the addition to the back of the house and increase in height. I was unable to call for more information until Tuesday. I appreciated that Mr. Longstaff sent me information regarding the request on Wednesday, shortly after he received my email. But this left very little time to read and understand the specifics of the proposal. I was unaware that there were any construction plans prior to receiving this card. I'm disappointed that the process was not transparent and timely. We are a community who understand the challenges of improving a home in our neighborhood. In this, and, but in this case, I cannot support the proposal as I feel it will adversely affect our community. I hope that both the town and those presenting proposals will consider carefully the effects of construction in our Higgins Beach community. We know that things will continue to change, but maintaining the character of Higgins is an important goal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Okay. Um, a couple of questions for you, Walt, if you wouldn't mind. We'll go back to the questions that we wrote down earlier from Solari. Yes. Um, I just thought taking notes because I couldn't figure out who asked. I, I, I did say, yes. Each of the documents, I thought I would give them to the clerk or to Mr. I know it's so I prepared those, but like you were told, those are preliminary and they're not using us. Thank you. Um, um, so the first comment that was made was uh, in the ordinance where you can remove structures and sort of gain back a claim of credit for removing impervious surface. Yes. Um, how do you address uh, the You're doing it for seven appeals which were before as we would, and I say at least 55 of them would remove structure to do other things. I've been here seven times with the jobs at Higgins Beach, and that's what we've always done. <clears throat> we didn't take the garage and torn them down and use that square footage to add on to it. We've taken driveways out, cut the width down, used the square footage for other things. In those instances where you remove driveway or you removed or relo you know, relocated a shed or brush for another portion, was that ground where the original structure was remain impervious or was it replaced with grass or 
which are quite short graphs, so we don't think about um, they're not impervious. They're just to take an impervious surface and build it, even, even the storage shed in some cases were removed. That square footage was added to the house so it didn't exceed the total that was existing before the construction. The reason that, that he brought up about doing this, okay, we come to the board to get approval for what we want to do before we remove anything. If we did remove anything before we came to the board, we lose that square footage. Uh, that's happened to a couple of clients down there who inadvertently removed things before they decided what they want to do with the lost the square footage. Um, and this happens from one end of Higgins Beach to the other in the Sugarland zone within the 75 foot half line setback thing. It, I, it's been used all over Higgins Beach as, as the normal way of doing it for the last 30 years that I've been working at Higgins Beach. Uh, the next question was um, with regard to roof extensions and are you familiar with the ordinance about the roof overhangs and what their limits are with regard to the setbacks of the property? Okay. I didn't count, well, the set doesn't refer to setbacks. Uh, it had nothing to do with the roof overhangs. If you take his beach and measure to the walls of the house, the overhangs don't count as far as setbacks. The existing, I didn't calculate it down exactly but the existing roof on the existing house has overhangs all around it, and the new one does. I didn't calculate it down to the square range to find out if we're two or three square feet less or more than before. Uh, but the, the, the carriage house out back, if you look at the plans, there's no overhang on the gable ends. There is on the front door, but that overhangs the blacktop, which I've already counted in the previous area in the calculations. So the overhang doesn't affect the impervious here as far as calculations go. So when I did it, we took that into consideration. Yes. Uh, the third question was the basis for the assumption of this being purely residential and not an accessory dwelling unit. Um, was there any indication from the, the not that this is a part of the application for whether its purpose or intent is for that property? It's for his kids and grandkids to enjoy when they come surfing. If you look at the plan, it's a garage, yes. There's, there's storage of surfboards, showers for changing, it's uh, wetsuit storage, and all this. And upstairs, after they surf, they have a room to go upstairs like a room. That's what's up there. There's nothing mentioned about it being rented out and put in kitchens and bathrooms and having an income in it and nothing like that at all. I don't know where he got that. Look for Mr. Chair, yes, go ahead. Uh, also, we could not permit a second dwelling unit because it is in the shoreline zone. Okay. Right. And so, therefore, we could never permit that. And that's your assurance that it can't happen. But one thing was brought up. But obviously, I don't know anything about what I'm talking about. I don't know. One thing that was brought up about this carriage house, so called the garage carriage house. The Higgins Beach are all called carriage houses. And you can't build a carriage house more than one story high. But you can add dorms to it, a 14, 12 roof pitch, and you can do many things. And this is a one story carriage house with the required, uh, with the allowable components that can be added to a carriage house. So it, it meets everything the ordinance says it's supposed to. Thank you. Um, with and regard one more thing. Go ahead. Talk about this large carriage garage. We could have put 24 by 24 in, but we're at 21 by 22, smaller than what the ordinance allows. So, okay. Thank you. Um, with regard to the existing foundations, can you confirm that is it a full foundation or is there on like cinder blocks or a CMU? It's a combination of a couple of things. First of all, it's a crawl space because it's ledge in the front of the existing building. Um, it used to be on post many years ago. And what was done was that the posts were taken out. They put in a concrete footing, a shot concrete wall, cinder blocks on top, so called concrete ones. That's typical of the way of doing that because you've got the house jacked up. You take the foundation out. You, you can't put a full foundation of concrete in, even in the crawl space, 
you can't get the chute underneath the house to drop the concrete into a form that goes all the way up to the house. So they cut the wall shot, pour the concrete, put in three or four courses and block above it up to the house. So yes, this got concrete block under it. Yes, and no addition could be all poured concrete. Lastly, the question was with regard to the preliminary calculations and why the retaining wall is not included in the new computations, or are they, are they? That retaining wall, so-called, is a stone wall. It's not a poured concrete wall. This doesn't have concrete footings and rebar and all that. It's a field stone, loose, uh, constructed stone wall. That's what's going to be proposed. And as such, it doesn't count to the calculations. If it was a void wall with footings and rebar and all that, then you'd have to count. Um, I don't have any further questions for you all. Thank you. Those are the, four, those are the five questions that I wrote down. <coughs> Larry. Okay. Um, you, can ask, you can ask the follow up questions. In terms of the total impervious soil on the lot, we heard numbers around 48%. Is that the current number? I hear about that, but I didn't figure it out because the way the rules read, um, you can see that I calculated what's existing and what's proposed. And you're only allowed 35% and or not to exceed what's existing. So I based it on what was existing and what we proposed. I didn't figure out an actual percentage on that as far as lot coverage, but I think it's worth around 47%. And, and ultimately, if we were to approve the, zone, the, the variances, you would have to demonstrate that to somebody at some point in the world that you, you didn't violate that standard. Is that correct? Or you have. Oh. Basically. Yeah, Mr. Chair. So if, if the board approved the variances tonight, that only allows the applicant to then submit a building permit application with a fresh site plan, fresh plan, because we don't know what's approved tonight is actually what's going to be on the permit. So the permit documents are separate from what you're looking at tonight. We're going to make sure that all of the same criteria is looked at, but we're going to recheck everything again as part of the building. So all of these calculations will be checked again as part of that. Um, the, the other thing I, I wanted to say too is the whole idea of this 35% versus what's existing. The shoreland zoning state statutes allow you to keep what you have developed as of January 1, 1989. If that existed as of 1989, you get to keep that. The 35% that we negotiated with DEP is for new construction, new lots. There have been a couple of lots that have divided, they've split. That 35% goes with, for those, the 35, and that's only in the shoreline zone, okay? Um, that's for new construction, but a lot of the lots were, as Mr. Um, Wilson stated, they're 100% developed, they, they basically, not maybe 100%, but they're well over 35% valid. If that happened and occurred before 1989, you are allowed to keep that. You can even reconfigure that same area in a different part of the lot if you revegetate the area that that was um, occupied prior. Uh, prior. That has been in the rules since I've been doing this since 1998. That has not changed. You've always had that, Mr. Chair. Yes. I just asked where in the rules they were. That was the question I asked before. Mr. Wilson. It's in the short it's in the shoreland zoning rules. Yes. I don't have the actual in your ordinance. In your ordinance? The ordinance says ah, that uh, Mr. the land area previously developed is not Mr. Mr. Freeze. You've had your chance to speak. Go ahead. So it is in the state statutes and it is in our ordinance, our shoreland zoning ordinance, it is in there. It makes reference to January 1, 1989 for lot coverage. The other thing you brought up was non-conforming. 
This is not a non-conforming structure with regard to shoreline. It is more than 75 feet from the highest annual tide line. There's nothing non-conforming about this structure with regard to shoreline. It is non-conforming with regard to Higgins Beach character code because it's too close to the property line. That's why they're here tonight. It has nothing to do with the shoreline variance. Mr. Lowry is correct in that we do have to look at that uh, lot coverage, but it is the existing lot coverage, assuming that it all happened since 1989, and I knew the Shures, and I'm pretty sure they haven't done any additional lot coverage in the last 20 years or so. So we're, we're, we went back and checked some historical uh, GIS photos, aerials. I'm satisfied that, that all existed as of that's the number we're using. And that's how we do that. So, so I wanted to just clarify that the nonconformance is not with regard to shoreline, other than the lot coverage exceeded the 35% and probably has for 34 years. Um, and your both services before the beach was covered. Right, exactly. Um, and, and the reason the large carriage house um, as described, was not mentioned in the public notices. This variance didn't have anything to do with the carriage right. house. Just but they start. have a right to do that as long as they don't exceed the existing lot coverage and they revegetate those areas that uh, they're removing buildings from. That's how we're getting there. Um, and as I said in my email to one of the one of the neighbors, and I can't remember which one now, forgive me. I am human, I can make a mistake, but I did check all the boxes on this, and I think we're in pretty good shape that way. I am not defending this application. I'm defending the process that got us to this application. And I object strenuously to any uh, inference that I don't know what I'm doing, because I've been doing this for 24 years, and I've had more training than Mr. Lowry's ever had on shoreland zoning regulations. So I will defend that. It's up to the board to decide whether this variance meets the criteria. And if it doesn't, that's the way it goes. I don't have a pony in this race. I'm just here to do my job. But I will defend the process. And I will not be insulted. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Do you have any what statute you're talking about? Mr. Lowry, please. I'd be happy to do that tomorrow. Thank you. Mr. Oh. May I say something about the variance question? Concise. The, some of the people that, uh, don't realize that certain things you can get a variance for and reduction for so many feet of the sidelines, so many feet of the front side. I'm not asking for a variance that's beyond the limitations of what the board can grant for the side. side Reductions. It's within the parameters of what's allowed. As a matter of fact, what we're asking for is less than what we could ask for if we had to. We could ask for five foot on the sides instead of two foot eight, for example. Um, so we aren't asking to, for a variance that's over and above what's normally allowed. Thank you. Miss Stone, you had a comment? Just uh, quickly, you, you've worked in this area a long time, and you must be aware of the, the pooling problems and the runoff and drainage in the area. I've been aware of that for 30 years. And in your opinion, and what you've designed will improve the situation on that property. Well, I talked to Public Works about it, and that line goes down and crosses ocean, House I did on the ocean has a manhole cover right in front of it. It comes from that line. It goes down between a couple of properties out to Pearl Street. And Pearl Street, there's a couple manholes. We, we, we located that drain line at that point. And he's right, it used to be a sewer line. Probably put in about 1898, started as the precedent of the It was put in before Higgins Beach became Higgins Beach, and there were just a few cottages. The problem with it, from my understanding, talking to the public works, they think they put it in back then, but they aren't sure. And they aren't sure if the town did it or if they were hired by people at Higgins Beach to put it in form. In any respect, they never got an easement over the land where the pipe was put in. 
so the town can't maintain it. Now, this pipe has been crushed and recrushed and crushed all over the place. And he's right, it used to run all the way down to the mash. One of the reasons was the streets at Dickens Beach used to run parallel to the ocean, not perpendicular. That got changed when Dickens Beach was divided up. Um, as far as my client's concerned, he has nothing to do with that pipe because it's on the abutters way. It's not on that. Not on the no, you're floor. reducing the runoff on your property. It's what I'm talking about. Your design is to improve the situation on your property. So there isn't runoff. Is what I'm trying to. Well, like one of the guys said, they cleaned that whole hill off with all the shrub and everything. That increased the runoff down the hill. Their properties on Cliff Street are about 10, 15 feet higher than, than this one. And it all runs down the hill. And that's you exacerbating the, the problem or improving the problem? They're, they exacerbated the problem. No, are you? Is no, your I don't design... believe it is at all. I don't believe it is at all. That was the thrust of the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the relocation of that stone wall, uh, where we put the garage, uh, we could have put it back further, but I didn't because I knew it would be a problem with runoff if we did. Taking the potting shed out, replacing that with the uh, lawn and topsoil. Uh, we have some slight grade changes on our lot, but not on the abutters lot and tie into the contours that already exist. So from that standpoint, we aren't raising up our land higher than the is and pushing the water onto them. We're not doing that at all. Uh, and like I said, most of that land on Cliff Street it pitches towards Cliff Street and a small portion to the backyard. We recognize that problem. And I recognize that problem with the pipe. And uh, the only solution coming with the public works folk, is they all have to grant an easement over their property to get it fixed and somehow come up with the money from the town to do it while they take care of it themselves. So their pipe on their land may be causing flooding on our street, on our, on my, our property, because that pipe doesn't work. Hey, you're wrong. Yeah. Thank you all. Appreciate it. I think you all set up this question. Any other new comments from the public? See, not going to close the floor. Close the public. Floor. So right now we're going to deliberate, deliberate internally as a board as we go through the criteria. Any comments from the board before we get started? The criteria. As well, I will read through each of the five criteria, and I'll go through an order for what our answers are, our findings and back conclusions here based on testimony we heard tonight and the information provided in the application itself. Number one, the existing building structure in the lot for which the limited reduction of yard size residential is requested was erected prior to July 3rd, 1991, where the lot is a vacant non conforming lot record. Sorry, Mr. Karen. Uh, <coughs> based on the information that's provided as part of the package, we discussed this evening, um, and my understanding that. The building was erected by 1991. Um, I don't believe that there was information provided about when the, uh, the garden shed was also uh, built. Mr. Fryer? Nothing out of that. Mr. Silva? Yeah. I'd also agree the information provided is that the structures were there prior to 1991 and agrees with the town. Mr. Bork? Agreed. Mr. Stevenson? Agreed. So, okay. Um, all those in favor of criteria number one being met, ready to vote? Aye. Uh, Mr. Prowler? Aye. Uh, Mr. Silverman? Yes. Uh, I will vote yes. Um, Mr. Bork? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Aye. Number two, the requested reduction is reasonably necessary to permit the owner or occupant of the property to use and enjoy the property in essentially the same manner as other similar properties are utilized in the zoning district. Mr. Karen. Uh, as we've seen, uh, the ordinances have changed over the years. Some properties have been uh, 
uh, more recent design and quality standards. Um, the intent of this was what was provided this evening is to use the property in a residential manner to save uh, over the same footprint. Um, uh, the other portions of the site uh, that may have been included are not relevant to this matter. Mr. Crowley. I'm struggling with this one. Um, the, um, and for a number of reasons. Um, first off, the, um, the, this, this is a substantial increase in footprint for the, just the building we're talking about and then increase in height. Um, there's another building next door which is increased in height. And I don't think at the same level of controversy as this one had. And that public comment today would suggest that, um, that, that the use of the property is not necessarily essentially the same as it has been enjoyed historically or by equivalent properties in this part of the beach. So I'm struggling with this one. I, I, I don't think I've found enough evidence to, 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 to say that this one's been done through. Thank you, Mr. Selton. <clears throat> We're looking at the five to stand, it's only the variance for questions. So the carriage house is consistent with the zoning ordinances and Higgins, and <clears throat> that can go forward without any, any issues. With respect to the what we're asking for, both the front and the side setback, um, those are within our <clears throat> prerogative to grant. They're less than the uh, five feet limitations that we have. Um, they're not going to change in any material way the closeness of the house to the property next door to the front of the yard. Um, with respect to the rear, there's plenty of room back there. There's you know, the areas where there's only request for the addition um, that <clears throat> was just mentioned, so that's not even in front of us. So in that respect, I believe that <clears throat> what they're asking for is reasonably necessary to allow them to use the house, and then all of the houses in the neighborhood are being used for. Thank you. I'll also point out again, the application that we're looking at here before is about the principal house only, not about the carriage house. To make clear that they're allowed to put the carriage house there without coming to us at all. Uh, and to make it bigger if they so want to. We've um, so <coughs> also heard testimony that from the applicants itself uh, that this is for family only and that there have been no discussions of any sort of friendly or anything like that. Not necessarily be allowed to use the one staff to vouch for that, that it's part of the ordinance in that space. They can't make that an accessory dwelling unit in the carriage house. Um, so, those are my thoughts on this. Uh, Mr. Bork. Yes, I'd like to add too that um, uh, these changes will uh, bring the home up to its current code standards, uh, eliminating the deficiencies that currently exist and also. Uh, bring it up to modern standards in terms of design, and also fully meet the uh, Higgins speech uh, design elements. So I think that's all very important, that uh, these improvements are uh, reasonably necessary to enjoy, you know, to fully enjoy this property up to what the current standards are. Ms. Stevenson? I have nothing else to Stop. Well, it's always difficult to see the added development pressures in the neighborhood, that's for sure. And uh, I do feel that this petition is within its right so as far as the zoning ordinance. It's uh, allowing you to apply for it. I don't see how I can vote against it. Thank you. And one comment, I believe Jane, you may have mentioned or Catherine earlier about um, the carriage house being the perfect point of view. Again, the carriage house is not part of this application, but one point I did want to make clear. Um, in, in Scarborough, with all these buildings being, you know, older buildings tear down construction, not, you're not entitled to your view. So unfortunately, and I, and I appreciate uh, and understand, uh, I empathize with this. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not desirable, but they are within the right to put that structure there. And unfortunately, if it is slightly blocking your view, that's just the unfortunate. Uh, circumstance of um, you are not entitled to the view here in the town of Scarborough. Um, going through the vote now for this one, Mr. Carrick? Aye. Uh, Mr. Frowlinger? No. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bork? Yes. Uh, Ms. Stevenson? No. Uh, Ms. Snow? Aye. 
now go by as well. Number three, due to the physical features of the lot and or the location of existing structures on the lot, it would not be practical to construct the proposed expansion, enlargement, or new structure in conformance with the currently applicable yard size and requirements. Is fair. Uh, the last answer this evening or that's the uh, existing footprints that may not be conformant with uh, newer zoning regulations that were established after the original construction of the building in 1903. Um, that therefore would necessitate the variance regardless of, uh, of the portions um, that may extend uh, to the front of the rear of the side. Um, and with the intent of trying to retain the front of the existing foundation or build upon the existing foundation as possible, um, uh, it does not seem reasonable to relocate uh, the footprint elsewhere on site to perform to the setback. Um, and in doing so, um, maintain any other on site drainage issues. Um, in Thank you, Mr. Crowley. The challenge with this one is always that we are presented with a single proposal, um, which is the one that's been scoped out by the developer and the owner. Um, and we're asked on the basis of that to, to ask whether it's practical to construct the expansion in conformance with the current applicable yard side requirement. Like most of the 50 by 100 lots, um, by one fifty lots in the usage, <clears throat> some variance is required to make any change. What I haven't been convinced by here is that they've done anything other than kind of a fait accompli. And for the developer also mentioned that the need would compromise, that the, that the um, an alternative siting would compromise the carriage house, if you agree it's not part of the variance. Um, it's, it, I'm not sure if that's really a valid or interesting point for the purpose of answering this question. Um, so again, on, on the basis of has it been demonstrated by the applicant that, um, that the the, the, the criteria for this has been met. I don't think it's been demonstrated. Um, it might be correct, but I don't think they've demonstrated to the standards that people want this work. So I, 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 I might be difficult to see a way clear to vote on yes on this one. Okay. Mr. Seltzer? <coughs> this is a little bit more problematic, and I appreciate the comments about not offering alternatives. Um, on the other hand, it was presented to us that any relocation of the same size structure would require a variance on one side or the other. Now, whether or not it would be more advantageous for certain property owners in the area to have it located five feet to the left, or 10 feet to the right, there are always going to be <clears throat> issues associated with that. But in either case, we would need to have a variance. And given that we would need a variance under any circumstances, it wouldn't be practical to construct without a variance. And I think that's what this question is really asking. Not whether it's practical with a different variance to construct, but whether it's practical without a variance. I think they demonstrated that it's not practical to construct without a variance. Thank you. Mr. Board. Uh, well, we have a very narrow and deep lot here. The overall is a rather small lot, but it's extremely narrow. Uh, the house is, you know, literally just deep, it's a small number of feet apart from each other. So that makes it very difficult to do anything other than try to maintain the current footprint to the greatest extent possible. So the variances that are being asked for here are all within what we can approve. And I think that's very important to uh, to know. Uh, and it's also important to say that, uh, that that the options here are not just simply, you know, do we, you know, you know, replace the building or do we, you know, re you know, try to improve the property? It's, it it re it really is uh, important to look at. There, yes, there are options, okay, but the most practical way of doing this is to work with the current structure. Uh, now, we didn't provide, we didn't see any cost estimates for doing it any other way, uh, but I think it's, it's reasonable to, to, to assume that building new would be far more expensive than what's being proposed here. With anything we've seen in the past, 
from other presentations that have been done, you know, uh, that's been the case. So this is definitely the most practical way to deal with this structure. Going up is the only practical way of going, and it's all within allowable variances that we can grant. Uh, Ms. Stevenson. Um, I tend to lean with Mr. Feinberg, um in that due the physical feature of the lot and location of the existing structure, um, would it be practical to keep it within the footprint and not need some of the variances? I don't, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling with it, but I, um, I would have liked to see or hear some other options that they would have considered um, if there were any. So. I have nothing to add. Okay, I, I believe it, what was pointed out, Mr. Bork, my thoughts, mm -hmm. um, variance for any kind of major work would be required on this lot. Um, and I think it's important keeping the footprint of the building on the Cliff Street side as it is to better maintain the line with the people's beach character because all the houses have to be that being said, uh, we're going to go down with our vote. Mr. Karen? Aye. Mr. Frolliger? Yeah. Mr. Silfman? Yes. Mr. Bork? Yes. Uh, Ms. Stevenson? No. Ms. Snow? Aye. Uh, and I will vote aye as well. Number four, the impacts and effects of the enlargement, expansion, or new building or structure on the existing uses of the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. Uh, Ms. Karen. With what was presented this evening, I had difficulty in, uh, in uh, verifying that this is not in fact different, uh, substantially different from the adjacent property. Um, I understand some photo documentation was provided, um, but um, I think uh, additional information could have been provided to more accurately answer uh, kind of for uh, to uh, close this uh, discussion. Mr. Collier? I I agree with Rudy. I'm actually somewhat more confused now than I was at the beginning of the discussion as to whether this will um, uh, um, be in, be able to meet the, uh, the, the not substantially different um, or greater or greater impacts of building or structure which conforms to the rest of the requirements. The, the nature of the drainage on the property is it's great to see these pictures, but understanding how this property works and either drains into that sort of ponding area in the back or doesn't or you know, so I'm, I'm just confused. So um, it's it's hard for me to know which way to go on this. Um, and I'm probably therefore err on the side of um, the I'll just we'll do. I'm not going to say my vote now, but I'm just kind of <coughs> where I think. Mr. Silkman? <clears throat> One of the pictures that I found particularly helpful, I actually, I actually drove around the other day because I had been in English Beach in quite a while, so I just wanted to see what it, you know, what it looked like and took a few pictures of my own. And just, make sure I understood what the houses that were being remodeled actually look like. And I think this picture is a particularly insightful picture, quite frankly. I mean, this is the new house in Union Beach. This is the old house in Union Beach. And so we've got a choice in this neighborhood. I mean, is, it, is the character of Union Beach this house? Or is the character of Union Beach this house? And it seems to me like all neighborhoods in Portland, in Portland descended in the the coast, increasingly the character of the neighborhood is this house. And the new house that's being proposed, when I looked at the drawings and I compared it to the pictures that I had taken, including of this house, it is very consistent with all of the new houses that have been personal plan. <clears throat> it's, we've been told that it's consistent with the new character code in Higgins Beach. That it meets all of the zoning requirements, the character code, and so on. And so, for that reason, I think that uh, the applicant is satisfied. Thank you, Mr. Court. Uh, I agree with Mr. Silpin uh, that uh, the, char the character issue is definitely within what is the current standard. 
you know, this this is very similar to every other new property in the East Beach area. Uh, and you know, whether it be a model or refurbishment like this one is, or a brand new one, you know, this is what the neighborhood is changing to. This is the future. So it wouldn't make sense to, to me to stay with the existing style. That's the past. Now, I'm also, you know, I just want to also point out too here that uh, the lot coverage issue is very important in that there, the lot coverage is actually being reduced in terms of impervious, impervious coverage. And in, I, I looked through the, all the criteria here and was trying to figure out where does stormwater runoff come into play here at all. Okay, it doesn't really come into any of the five criteria that we're looking at. It's not part of this at all. And I realize it's a huge problem in this neighborhood, and it's not just on this property. It's in the whole neighborhood because of, of a defective sewer line that really needs to be solved. So the neighborhood needs to advocate for getting that done collectively. But that's not the issue that we're faced with right now. But I think it's important to know that the uh, the property owner has designed this in such a way that it reduces the impervious coverage of the lot. And that's very important. So it's not increasing stormwater runoff, it's actually slightly decreasing. And that's even with carriage house, which we're not even considering right now. All we're really looking at is the home itself. So in this, in this particular situation, I. I really think that you know, the building fits in very well with the, with the neighborhood in every way. Thank you. Ms. Stevenson. I have nothing further to add. So, nothing to add. Um, I think it's always important whenever uh, I have a question on any of these applications is to go back and just read the actual verbiage and the criteria here. Um, the impacts and effects of the large expansion of new building or structure on existing uses of the neighborhood will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts and effects of a building or structure which conforms to the yard size requirement. Um, I think that's very important to note here that if, if, if they did construct a building somehow in here that accomplished everything, uh, the massing would still be the same. You would still have a house this size going on that lot somehow, somewhere. And the fact that they're purposefully keeping the structures uh, as forward to the lot as possible near Cliff Street to avoid having any more of that, uh, any elevation in the backyard to help or to, to, to increase more of the drainage into that pond area that comes up uh, uh, during high water rainstorms is important to note. Sorry, I'm not to speak this way. Um, Mr. Karen, how do you vote? Aye. Mr. Frohlinger? No. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Bork? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Aye. I vote aye as well. Seeing that, is that I will entertain a motion to approve appeal oh, number. Oh, I'm something. sorry, excuse me. Pardon me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the applicant does not commence construction of the enlargement expansion building or structure for which the limited reduction yard size requested. I think you just need to confirm with the town, the city still on staff, you can confirm that they have not commenced construction of the property. I wasn't down there today, but the last time I was down here last week. <laughs> Thank you. And that has been confirmed by the applicant, so I don't think that's necessary to go through uh, and vote on this one. Um, so I will entertain a motion to approve uh, appeal number 2728 as presented. Mr. Bork? So moved. Is there a second? I second it. Mr. Sullivan, any, uh, any additional discussion before we take our final vote on this? Okay, Mr. Karen? Aye. Um, Mr. Frelinger? Yeah. Mr. Silkman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Bork? Yes. Ms. Stevenson? Yes. Uh, Ms. Snow? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Uh, application passes. Mm. Thank you all for your time. Mm. Are there any uh, mail-ins? Any mail-in people?
No, no, we received them ahead of time through you. And these are these are visible. The, the only ones that we didn't get were the test out. Yes, we're thinking some of our other neighbors also voted to complain that it's not. We received all of them. Yeah, those, those are all nine. Yeah. I don't have them. You know, that's all right. I don't have a problem with the yeah, I I yeah, the storm on the all right, folks, so we have any comments that we'd like to make? Comments from the town or general comments from board members at this time? Thank you, Alberto, for your patience tonight. It was a long one, but we have to go through your due diligence to answer each question and give everyone their due diligence and time to allow them to speak. And as you saw tonight, uh, some people like to take advantage of that and stay on the right phone a lot longer um, when they really should be. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something that we encounter. And uh, thank you all very much for your patience. And you did well. Well, just a comment on that. I think yes. That you, made, you did make a comment about uh, asking people to be concise. Uh, and that's, that was appropriate, but unfortunately, it was after the fact. Yes. With that rant that we heard tonight. It was totally. It was, it was inappropriate, and Brian, you do nothing but excellent work for the town and the zoning board, uh, and I can't thank you enough for all the work that you do, and uh, I apologize, I wasn't more helpful in defending you there, but it's very completely uncalled for. It's but, not uh, your job, say, to defend me, but I won't stand up here and, and have somebody insult the process, and again, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to be Switzerland and be neutral, but I will defend the process, not the decision, you're not not the application. You were very clear in that. Yeah. And I appreciate you doing that, and I hope you never stop doing that. Um, that being said, I, I have just one, one yes, comment. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> and it's coming on the heels of this a little bit awkward, but Brian sent out a, an email to us all following the decision that we made a property down in Central Lane. And I was a little taken aback by the email. I mean, it was. <clears throat> After the fact, it, you know, with emails like that become public documents, and I, I, my initial temptation was to respond in, in kind to, to say that you know, he was wrong, that we did have cost information on the documents that were presented, that we did have pictures, that some of us do know what that area looks like, and those pictures were relevant, they were close. You know, in, in one instance, one of the pictures was three houses away, which is what I would consider a neighbor. And um, I just I just didn't feel completely comfortable doing that because I don't want <clears throat> any activity to take place outside of the board. And I uh, would just ask in the future that maybe we don't do that, that any comments that uh, any of us have about the process, that we either share them or you know, use this opportunity to convey concerns or questions about those rather than private email channels. Sure. I mean, in any of this, it's, it's certainly not private. Anyone can never, uh, anybody can um, uh, request a Freedom of Information Act to request records of any kind of emails that circulate between board members. And it's not, not going into your personal email. It's not anything sent to the town on the business of the zone of appeals. Um, it was one, uh, so I, and I appreciate that. And again, 
the board changes over time, over years. Uh, I was here four years ago with a very different board then, um, and uh, I've been here not very long, but long enough to see that every year to two years this board changes wildly and drastically. And a lot of times it's it's uh, it's challenging just to you know make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page and some things that you know may have come up in the recent past, but it's far enough away that to be completely disconnected what we're doing now, but that does have you know a pertinent uh, application for it. it. It is good to be brought up. Can we make, can we do better? Yeah, absolutely. But that's why we are a volunteer board. You know, everything that we do here together, the stuff is, is are things that we um, can improve upon together. And so feedback like this is very important for us to have. So thank you for that, Richard. Um, one, one thing I did want to mention though, um, and this was mentioned, this was brought up, uh, we had our last attorney meeting, uh, in past attorney meetings as well. You haven't had a chance to, to sit in on any of those yet, Richard, but they're, they're really valuable. And uh, we tend to do them about once a year or so, sometimes twice a year, but um, I, please don't go out to the site and perform a site investigation on your own. Um, Thank that, you, I was going to mention that. No, no, it's okay. I slapped every hand on this board because everybody has done it at least once. Uh, and, that's, and that's okay. Um, it, what, what, it, what, it, what, it, what it does what it does is you, you have to go and you have to disclose it and give everyone the opportunity to go with you because then now you have a perspective that's unique to your own that we all don't have. And that perspective could be used to change an opinion of a board member from solely your perspective alone, whether good, bad, or different. Um, and uh, would recommend just not to do that in the future. That's all I did. I'm, I'm confused because during the hearing, you said that part of it, we're a citizen board, we're all residents of Scarborough, we all know the community. Yep. And so if we all know the community, then we ought to know the community. That, absolutely. So not, not to, I mean, how else are you going to know the community? You may, you may have known that area without having to make a personal visit there, right. because you've been there last week. Right, and 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 that's the and there's a very very thick gray line of well, I drive by this business yeah. every single day. That's in violation of something that we put into the zoning board that we had on an application. Uh, there was one instance of a, of of you know a violation or just a. Uh, I'll say a, a, a separation of what was understood in the appeals process and what was put into actual application of physical use. I drive by it every day. Some people may drive by it more frequently. And we can't purposefully go out of our way to check these spots out. That's why we try to have like the Google Maps brought up, the tax map brought up. We encourage applicants to have photos in there. If you do feel the need to go out to a site, like really like to go and check the spot out, um, email the whole board and we'll plan a trip together. Yes, it's, that's the public that's, knowledge too, though. It, it, it does have to be a public knowledge because anytime, anytime all of us are together. Well, that would be certainly the case. Yes, that would have to be. Who would be noticed that it would be a meeting? It would, have, it would be, it would, it's technically a meeting, even if we all go off and drink coffee for 15 minutes, that's still a meeting that the public has to know about with like a week's notice and everything else. Um, so in the, in the future, um, if we do want to do that, like let's 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 go and chat it amongst the board and we can- But I don't that. want to do that. I mean, right. that's, that. That's the whole purpose of not, but I, 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 again, I don't understand it. Did your attorney tell you that you are not allowed to look at the site? We're not allowed to go to a site and look at it with the sole purpose of it being related to this application. If you happen to be going to the beach that day, or if you know a neighbor on that road that you, you happen to visit um, frequently, and you just happen to be more familiar with that place, then yes. Me personally, I, I rarely spend much time down in this area at all, just in general, me personally. I'm not going to go out there um, for the purpose of this application to go check some things out and take photographs and things like that. It, it just um, it just makes it um, it makes it problematic, especially if it's a uh, hot button application that a lot of folks are really focusing tend tend to focus on. But about and this is and this is the advice that our council. But what is it? What is it that <coughs> creates the, the problem? 
Is it that one person on the board has more knowledge than another person? Yes, exactly. But that happens all the time. I mean, you have more knowledge of property that you see every day than I do. You have to disclose that. True, but you have you, you typically have to either a disclose that or you know the, the common knowledge that we are residents of Scarborough, in different parts of Scarborough, we're all familiar with those particular areas. It's not something that you know, I'm writing down on my profile for the chairman of the board position. But um, I, I guess. We, we can't purposely go to locations with the intent of documenting photographs and checking out the property or the intent of bringing it to the school. We, we can't be doing that. And that's, that's really more of a distinction. We, we can certainly go and go take a look and, and but then to come back and share things that you saw or, or noticed while you were there without everybody else having that scene experience that's where it's problematic it's fine to give yourself some context so they're, they're I'm not familiar with that neighborhood I just want to see yeah that's what you got well, and that, that's, that's, work. that's, work. that's, that's work. good yeah. and I can understand the issue about sharing information that, that would be appropriate right <clears throat> but on the other hand being able to go down and visit the spot seems like it would be perfectly reasonable thing to do it is for your own personal context, but you can't come to the board and say, hey, I did the site investigation to the whole bunch of photos, and I saw this right here. That's very problematic. I just you don't understand the distinction. You take yeah. photos, and that's evidence that you have that nobody else has. That now has to be disclosed. That's and that's what others have to have access to, and, and so on. There's a section in the NIP manual that you they discuss, yeah, no, no, I do that. I'm just going to give you more context. But hey, we are all volunteers on this board. And again, everybody's we're, doing this. We're, yeah, we're learning everything together. It's clear as you all see it. I still have plenty of things I need to learn about this. So. Um, but I thank you all again for your service on this board. It's very important. It's very important that we have you know, all this experience here. <clears throat> next meeting is Yes, next meeting is remote in July. Um, so please. Keep in mind about that. Uh, don't have anything else. So is it is the second yes. Wednesday a good day, or is that like a day after Fourth of July? Or anything? It's it's in the middle of uh, it's Fourth of July week, so a lot of people are gone. Yeah, like myself. However, I am able to remote in. Yeah, so okay. that is the that is the, the, the well, theory there. Well, also the week boom. after. Oh, is that wait, didn't we? Sorry, no. it's the week after. Yeah, Sorry, it's the week after. Just we're going to the next one. Yeah, okay. and and then, yeah, the original yeah. robot I think is also taken and stuff like that. So we're just running or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We are remote next month. Yeah. month yeah. July. So motion to adjourn. Move. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.